everyone to our stream. We are Night Dive Studios. We are making System Shock right now. We are uh, in the last 48 hours. We just hit, I think, hour 47 left of our Kickstarter campaign uh, with the team here. We have myself. I'm Jonathan Peros. I do the audio. Uh, we have uh, Daniel Grayson. Uh, Grayson? Uh, Grayson, Who yes. is the producer on the team. Grayson. <laughs> and we have Stephen Kick, uh, our leader and CEO. Uh, we also have with us Rob Waters, who is our concept artist and the concept artist from the original System Shock, System Shock 2, Thief Games, Bioshock, Freedom Force. Uh, amazing artist. Um, we also have coming in soon, we have Warren Spector, Paul Nureth, and Tim Stelmick of System Shock 1 fame. Well, of uh, many other games fame. Uh, but these guys were on the original System Shock 1 team. Uh, they are working at Other Side Entertainment currently, who are the gentlemen that we've been working with to make System Shock 3. And they're going to be stopping in in a little bit. They're doing some prep work right now. Uh, so we're going to play through the demo of System Shock right now um, with, with us. And then the Other Side guys are going to come and pop in and start talking about that and then we're going to go into the original system shock with the original makers uh and i think it's going to be a cool stream uh on this stream if you see below in the info section you'll see a link that says kickstarter if you haven't already please check out the kickstarter campaign we are getting to the final stretch now and we are making stretch goals at this point we have been funded uh and we are continuing funding and, and the whole campaign has been just awesome because of you guys um, also, you're going to see a new tweet this button. Also, go ahead and do that if you guys could. Uh, share this stream to your friends. It'll uh, set up a tweet for you so that we can get more people seeing this awesome stream, more eyes on the project, more ears listening to us, Paul, Warren, and Tim. Um, as for the status, we announced uh, some Kickstarter stretch goals today. We, uh, we, we announced more stretch goals for the for VR support, mod support, for the System Shock uh, uh, source code, which is going to be awesome. Um, and also, if you do follow us on Twitch tomorrow, starting at noon Pacific, uh, we are going to have a 24-hour stream with a lot of guests uh, for the for the the closing hours of our Kickstarter campaign. Uh, as for guests, we have coming in, we have. Uh, Alexander Brandon from Deus Ex while we go through Deus Ex with him. We have Rachel Messer who's Rebecca Lansing's uh, VO who's going to play some Warframe with me. We're going to have um, Chris Avalone play through Fallout New Vegas with us. We're going to have people on, on our team like Jonah Loeb show how he does uh, 3D modeling. We're going to have Max do animation on stream. We're going to have a whole schedule that's going to come out today so keep up with the Kickstarter updates. It's going to be it's going to be really awesome. We just confirmed that uh, Steve Gaynor, the um, head of Fulbright Studios here in Portland, is going to be joining us as well at, um, I think, 9 p.m. on Wednesday. And uh, he was also responsible for the design work on uh, Bioshock 2 Minerva's Den DLC. Um, so that's going to be really fun to have Steve on the show. And uh, I think he's requesting that we play uh, No One Lives Forever. So we might do that. Oh, I know that you guys wanted to play some No One Lives Forever, and we couldn't figure out when or how to do that, so I'm sure Daniel would be <laughs> real excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Daniel, you want to get the uh, you want to get the demo started for yeah. us? Yeah. Right. Uh, Dustmancer is actually saying, uh, "Are we going to push this? We, you know, maybe we should do that." Ooh. Yeah, can yeah, we should do, we should absolutely do that. All right. So, um yeah, this is the very first room in the game. <laughs> uh and actually the the first thing that we did um months actually about a year ago, um this this past July, um I teamed up with um some artist friends of mine and we we built this first room as kind of a just a prototype just to see you know what this first room would look like uh, directly translated from the original game uh, to see if you know um, it would be good enough to to move forward and and uh, kind of flesh out the rest of this and and then pitch it to you guys as a project uh, 
that Night Dive would take on. So this room, I've seen a lot of iterations, and actually if you go back to some of our Kickstarter updates, uh, you'll see some early prototype shots that I've, that I've uh, posted in there. Uh, also of note, in this room, uh, there's that steam that's coming out, and that is what I use to do pretty much all of my debugging when it comes to environmental sounds in the game, because if anything in Unity breaks with our audio integration, then that steam breaks, and you cannot just even guess the amount of times where I load that up, the steam isn't working, and I go, God dang it, we have to figure something out. Yeah, how many times did that happen? You're like, oh John, my God. I don't think any <laughs> of this least, works anymore. <laughs> I swear the half my job on this project is fixing those damn sparks and steam. <laughs> I think Daniel, the uh, the health and energy values are the exact same as the original game too, right? When you yeah. wake up. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, with these animations, we you know um, you'll probably notice a big difference from the first uh, version of the demo we released uh, when the Kickstarter first launched. I mean, we we heard everybody's feedback, and they're like, "Man, this is just way too long." And so that was one of the first things that we did is we we cut the the length of those animations. Why do the gloves have two missing fingers? Kaimo Daisetsu is asking on Twitch. Uh, Rob, oh, well, are you, Rob, are you there? Okay, maybe Rob's not hooked up. What were you going to say, John? I was going to guess that it's so that when uh, the hacker needs to use his iPhone, he can have some bare fingertips with which to tap the button. <laughs> Yeah, Rob, Rob's in here. I think his, his mic is just muted. Um, I, I also remember when, when we were discussing about it, um, I remember the, the discussions. Uh, I think the reason why the two gloves, the two fingers are showing is to humanize it a little more because before the original concepts, I think were just gloves and there wasn't going to be any skin at all. And it made it harder to relate to the hacker as a, as a, as a person. Whereas if you see some flesh, it makes it easier to suspend the belief that you are that character. I seem to remember having that discussion, um, you know, when we, when we first got those concepts back from Rob. And I think that was a pretty good choice because, you know, the gloves are so futuristic. There's um, those glowing circuitry and it kind of gives a, a great contrast between, um, you know, the cybernetic life forms that you fight later on and then, you know, your own humanity yeah, I'm about um, to pick up the multimedia data reader, so we'll be we'll be hearing uh, Rebecca Lansing's um, incoming audio log in a second. Oh, yep, t uh, she will be again. Her voice actress Rachel Rachel Messer will be on this stream at 2 p.m. Pacific tomorrow, playing Warframe with us. Uh, and you should check her out on Twitch. She or Twitter. She's actually phenomenal. She does a lot of anime work too. Yeah, GTG3000, it is a uh, work in progress audio log. Um, we know that there have been some uh, comments about Rebecca's relationship with the player and how it's not consistent with the first game. And um, one of the reasons that we did this and we kind of uh, wrote a new log was just to give an example, more than anything, of the style um, of the new logs that we want to create. And um, yeah, just to provide you guys with an example of, of what you can expect. Um, Tygon Panthera is saying that the game audio is very low. Is that true for everybody? They want, okay, yeah, they yeah, I'm seeing more of that too. Bit. Okay. Dan, is there anyone? Um, um, yeah, I'll... Um, I'll uh, I think Rob's here. I think the... Hello? Yeah, yeah, hey, I'm Rob. Here. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, Rob Waters, everyone. Concept artist for this game and the previous System Shock games, Bioshock games, Rob? these games. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, Rob Waters, everyone. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, Rob, you might have to put headphones on. We're getting on. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Also, Daniel, did you enable the overlay in uh, the demo? I did. It's not showing up. No. Oh, oh well. Uh, that might mean restarting Discord. No, you should need to re restart it. Um, it might be a separate app, though, if you're running it directly. So you might need to grant your permissions. Technical difficulty, folks. Just one sec. Woo! Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, did we not expect this <laughs> at some point? <laughs> Rob, do you have any feedback on on uh, the design decision for the gloves? I know that was kind of a question that we're that we're getting. He's muted. I think he's looking for headphones for himself. Oh, okay. John, this would be a good time to play the elevator music. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do that in uh, I I don't know how to do that in Discord. <laughs> I think I might have to restart Discord. I will be uh, just a few moments. All right. Well, I'm going to answer some questions on Twitch here. So, Coke bottle. Why does the bot carry around a can of soda? Um, in you know before Citadel Station, you know, completely went to hell. That he was a serve bot, and he would uh, basically go around and provide you with treats and snacks and sodas and. Anything else that uh, you could use while you're working, and so his great so... great grandfather was a Roomba. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I'm, yeah, that's work. That's working now. Uh, Valet two, uh, tell us the story. How did you find the source? One where uh, we might have to ask. Uh, Paul Nareth about that when he signs on a bit later. Um, all I know is that uh, based on what he told me, they basically went into the archives um, and they were able to find it somewhere. Uh, but I'm sure that this story is a lot more interesting than that. <laughs> They're a rolling mini fridge. Hey, mini fridges don't have arms that stab you in the gut. No, on Return of the Jedi. R2 was basically like a like a, just a rolling cocktail tray. Yeah. You know, that's a pretty good idea. Maybe we should uh, kickstart that next. A, like a mobile mini fridge. <laughs> We're getting into the appliance business. <laughs> I'm going to have so much music to write for that fridge. <laughs> it'll have a jingle when it opens. When you fill it with vegetables, it'll have a little victory fanfare. <laughs> When leftovers go bad, it's going to have, you know, tense battle music. Yeah, you know what's weird is uh, the surf bots. I know a lot of people say that um, it reminds them of that uh, the character from Power Rangers. Ay, 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 ay! I definitely see that, but for whatever reason, they remind me of that robot that um, Rob Schneider hides in in the uh, 1995 version of Judge Dredd. <laughs> starring uh, uh, Stallone. I don't know why that makes me think of that. <laughs> it's a good movie. I don't know. Maybe Talk not. about where, where Daniel right now is in, in the demo and like kind of, you know, commentate on it. <laughs> uh, grenades. Okay. I have grenades now. Yeah, this was kind of a fun thing. Um, we obviously we didn't have time to implement the grenades um, during the first. Uh, release of the demo, but um, we were hard at work as soon as the Kickstarter launched, and we made sure that um, you could throw those and blow things up. And I know I was pretty pleased with how it worked out. Uh, I think Rob is available thing. again. If you uh, wanted him to talk about some stuff in here, I love the Rob, are you stations. There? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> hey, Rob. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, um, actually, I have a question for you, Rob. Um, like, um, <clears throat> in System Shock 1 and in Bioshock, Bioshock Infinite, uh, the, these games that have, um, you know, your first weapon is like the melee weapon, right? It's like the pipe. Yep. Um, what was your design process when creating this pipe? Because I know that when we were talking about it, you know, we wanted it to be like a futuristic space pipe, but we didn't want to put like lights and... and blinky things all over it um mm. there's there's you know in these types of games like the looking glass 
family of games it's you know the pipe is is your is your first weapon of choice and it and it ends up being kind of an iconic thing that that runs throughout is there is there any kind of thought process that you had behind this iteration over any of the other pipes and and bludgeoning devices that you've designed in the past um well i i think for this one um i'm fairly certain way back in the day i did that you know uh little pipe bit map from the original game and so directly translated you know it just ends up looking pretty lame as far as you know just being a, a you know more or less a cylinder um so I, I just wanted to you know beef it up a bit more and build it out give it some heft uh some chunkiness uh so it just be more satisfying when you're like bludgeoning someone and then and then the color was added added you know i did that specifically orange so it would you know stand apart from the um you know the predominantly blue areas that you're in at least in this initial uh part but at the very least you know it just does a splash of color uh you know against you know whatever whatever it's you know coming against Yeah, I think um, one of my goals, I like to make props on the side. I was thinking about going to the hardware store and seeing if I could actually build one of these things from uh, like PVC. <laughs> yeah, it'd be possible. Stage went well. Man, PVC isn't going to, it's not going to donk hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> the I had to bring it in this one. I had to. <laughs> Thanks, John. I'm going to grenade this mutant. Yeah, oh, but he's just <laughs> backtracking to the gloves. You were, you know, you're right. That's I think ultimately that's why we showed the the finger. So there was that. Um, so there wasn't the uh, question mark as far as if you were a robot or whatnot. You could, you know, you could see the flesh of your fingers and just, you know, know that you're human and <laughs> just have cool gloves. Uh, let's see. We're getting a qu a question from Jungle Strike Guy. Did Terry re-record those lines for the demo, or are they from the original game audio? Um, we actually reused the original audio um, for that, but um, kind of like with what we did with uh, Rebecca Lansing's line, we're going to go back and revisit all that stuff and re-record it and uh, make it fresh and uh, kind of put a new. Um, I guess, how would you describe it, John? Like a new kind of glitchy... Yeah, I mean, I want to keep the glitchiness uh, actually pretty pretty close to the original because uh, that's such a huge part of her character, and I, I feel like changing that uh, too much, if if even much, much at all, is going to make Shodan come off different. Her voice is very iconic, and I don't really want to touch that. Well, we can, I mean, she'll have different lines that Chris will work on, um, but I think when it comes to her tonality and the way that she glitches, I don't, I don't think that there's any any way that we should really be changing much with that. I mean, just re -re having recordings at higher fidelity uh, than we're, you know, able to be done in 1994 games when it came to space requirements for uh, for video games. Um, yeah. I just want to say that I never thought Shodan was glitchy. I just felt all those were features and made her more beautiful. <laughs> How noble of you. Oh, Max has joined us, our animator. Hey, Max. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, Valet 2, to kind of go along with what we're talking about, he says, uh, Greg did the voice processing for SS1, Eric did for the second, who's going to make Shodan sound in this game. Uh, we are having Eric Brocious uh, do the, pro the processing and the engineering on um, uh, Terry's voice for this game. Did Greg do it in the first one, or did, did Eric do it in the first one? I'm not sure, to be honest. Hmm. Rob might know. What was the question? Uh, do you know if uh, Eric 
uh, Brocious or, or Greg Lepiccolo did the processing for Shodan's voice in Shock 1? Mm. Uh, that... Let me see. That I do not know. Okay. Yeah, we're getting a lot of questions here. And amazing comments. I, I just love, Shodan's a strong independent AI, you don't need no human. <laughs> <laughs> Max, I think they want to just hear you talk. <laughs> uh, th this guy has a good question, Leah Ritali, 1917. Uh, what are the plans for a, a system, sh a Shodan romance side quest? <laughs> are we gonna have... Chris work on that or uh no comment we're not allowed to talk about that oh it's too early in development Shh, sorry sorry, sorry, sorry now we can't yeah Shh. romance side quest yeah uh data from star trek is going to show up uh ever after having uh broken up with the borg queen <laughs> can we say he has a type <laughs> <laughs> Oh, mutant lives matter. Okay. Oh, gross. <laughs> oh, Max, I'm not sure if you saw it. Like, Daniel just indiscriminately grenaded a mutant that was just sulking in a corner, minding his own business. He was cruel. That's really rude. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty rude, himself. dude. He didn't do anything to you, Daniel. But he would have given the opportunity. Oh, that's what, profiling. What? <laughs> Do you Actually, just go around blowing people up who are uglier than you? I got a I got a question for our uh, for our Twitch for our community here. Um, in regards to the puzzle, do you guys like the fact that it, you can like uh, interact with it in world, or would you rather have it be um, similar to how you interact with the boxes, where a separate um, like dialogue box comes up and then from there you can kind of interact with the puzzle like that the interact sense. mode in uh, in shock 2 yeah exactly yeah basically it, it should it be dialogic or should it be a separate ui in world in world in world pop up. although i definitely think it would help if we like somehow to control the camera to really make it like Guys, so people I could think see better be at the end of the day, yeah, you know, we just, those, those. we'll just choose whatever we feel is working best. Exactly. Well, there could be a there could be a way to sort of have both, maybe where the camera kind of locks into it a little bit, and it's still in the world, but then you can sort of move your crosshair, so it's not a separate like uh, icon in the HUD that shows up in the corner of the screen that you click on with a yeah. mouse, but instead the camera kind of locks in, and then you can use the crosshair as a mouse to select, and that way. We might have the best of both worlds. So it keeps it diegetic when it comes to atmosphere, but it's also easier to control. I don't know, mm -hmm. just a thought. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to get everybody's opinion, just just mm -hmm. out of curiosity. I love the repair bots. Oh yeah, I I love the fact that they explode now, and uh, the arc of electricity that comes out of them is just when it hits you, it feels like it's tearing through you. Yeah, that turned out really great. Remember, everyone, if you uh, back the Kickstarter at a certain tier, I think it's the with what the big box tier, you get a little you get a little print of those guys. You get your own little model of those little those little cutie patootie scorpion men. Yeah, and the way that we're kind of planning it, um, I can't confirm this, but um, what we'd like to do is basically when you receive the big box and you open it up, uh, the repair bot will come in a little like sealed foil bag. Um, as if he's coming straight from the manufacturer, like they're our fictional manufacturer. And when you open it up, you'll be able to um, assemble it yourself, kind of like a build your own repair bot. <laughs> it saves us the uh, the cost of having to pay someone to build these repair bots for them. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say they come in these the little bags and it'd be like like little Shopkins. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't save <laughs> us the time. It adds interactivity to the experience. <laughs> hey, people, when you're going to be building the repair bots, we'd like it to be in the world or in a separate UI. <laughs> <laughs> I love that the lights, every single light pretty much is destructible in the environment. It, uh, 
really adds re adds to it, and and uh, we'll have things like grenades hopefully affect that Why explosion. Do the lights things in the world. Daniel? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I just I just, just like it? destroying yeah. things. Oh man, I think I just realized something. I got to put it in a bug for then when it comes to audio and breaking those lights. <laughs> they have a they have a ground hum each of those lights because there's that little switch on sequence, and each of them have their own little. Uh, low proximity hum that comes from it, and I don't think that turns off when you break the light like it should. Ah. Oh, ca uh, cameo. Uh, we can't go past that door. That's not uh, not an, an available area quite yet. We've got safety railings. <laughs> you think the station is OSHEA compliant? OSHA, OSHA compliant, OSHA, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep, safety railings, you gotta have them or, you know, space OSHA will come and get you. Railing death incoming. Yeah. <clears throat> hey guys, mind if I add an other side person to this now? I sure. wouldn't mind it, but in a very positive way. All right. Well, here it comes. He needs to unmute himself though and introduce himself. The anticipation's killing me. I know, right? Same. <laughs> They're still muted. <sighs> Who is it? <laughs> Maybe we can have a guess and chat. No, no, keep holding your breath, John. This this will work out great for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the whole chat. Who is it? The suspense is killing me. Almost there. Yeah, you'll just have to click the little microphone Electronic. icon down below. Oh, maybe I went to the kitchen go get some cheeses. <laughs> I just really Colors. love Colors. just standing in this room and just watching the sun go by. The sun, which you'd like to destroy if you could. Mm, no, it's pretty important. The last time I checked. Yeah, this is um, this is and one of those areas. Important. Um, this is one of the areas in the game where, um, in the original, um, all you're treated with is like a two by three um, window that just looks out into blackness with uh, a couple of white stars, and um, we kind of looked at that as our as our opportunity to um, you know show you guys what we have in mind for a lot of these areas where we feel like um, the real scale of Citadel Station can be shown and um, and be felt while you're playing the game and um, so there's a bunch of other areas in the game that that um, we're gonna address in a similar way yeah it was, it was really important to us to uh, in the original or to, to in the first couple rooms have have things be pretty accurate to the original to, to show you guys that we do want to respect the original in that sense we want people to recognize things when they see when they play the demo uh, but then we're able to once we get that recognition of of the original game in this demo we're able to start showing how we can take that original vision and start to push it into more modern realistic ways like this room which is more something that might actually be on the space station so good news our other side guest uh has is, is working now uh go ahead and introduce yourself people from other side oh hey can you hear me now this is tim yep yeah oh hi hey, hey tim. tim hey i was so desperate there because i heard you talking about the view out the out the port and i, I have a story <laughs> so oh you. perfect so well, that's actually, an anecdote hang on. Tim, first, can you introduce yourself and tell us what you did on the original game? Yeah, my name is Tim Stelmach. Uh, I was uh, uh, one of the uh, design team on the original System Shock. 
So uh, I did, uh, you know, the, the, the whole team was, was so collaborative. I don't remember if we had, had individual job titles or anything, but uh, among other things, I, I did a bunch of the, uh, a bunch of the level design. I did the science level and uh, the engineering level and parts of other stuff. Uh, I did, I did uh, some of the design on the, uh, those, uh, those, those uh, hardware hacking puzzles for opening doors and stuff, you know, uh, coding for the, the, those little, the little mini games that you get in your interface. And I forget what all, there's lots of, lots of miscellaneous stuff in addition to a bunch of level design. So that's me. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this view out the window, you were, you were, you were talking about how you know, in the original, there was just a, just these like distance, this distant star field up until like just literally like a couple of weeks before we shipped, we didn't have the star field. We just had, we just had like star patterned wallpaper on those windows. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, we all, we all disliked it so much that like James Fleming was one of the engineers on the project. He was desperate to get in like a parallaxing star field. <laughs> Um, and Warren, who we can give shit for this later when he comes on, right? Like he was trying to get us all to finish the game, right? So, um, so James gets this star field in, and and uh, and actually Harvey Smith was was lead playtester down at Origin with Warren at the time, and he was the first to see that we had like put this feature in at the last minute, and so he like turns to Warren and says like, "Hey, there's a there's a there's a star field out this window," and Warren's like, "What?" And then <laughs> Harvey, just to troll him, says. Yeah, and I think there's like one of the Kilrathi spaceships from Wing Commander out there. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> Totally made this up. Just to like screw with it. It was like, beautiful. Anyway, that's that's my story about the stars. That's the stars. my new headcanon is System Shock is a prequel to Wing Commander. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the same universe canonically. Yeah. I love that you can see the groves from the windows as well if you look up. Oh yeah, that that's a nice touch. No, I lo I love this view. When I when I first saw this in the demo, I was I was so happy. <laughs> now, kind of a funny story. Uh, actually, a couple weeks before this demo, we had star wallpaper as well. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, any other stories you guys want to tell about this room? Oh. Well, what about any of the uh, and what about any of the previous rooms too? He he wasn't here in some of the the earlier ones. Are we going to yeah, go I back? Like, I was kind of watching. Uh, you know, I, I I really liked. You know, someone was commenting on, uh, I th I think maybe on the chat on all the work that you guys have done to uh, to, to sort of interpret all these surfaces, because you know the original game was you know, it was a tile based game. Everything was on the square grid. The walls were just flat textures, like everything was just painted on, and like especially like those sections where it was like where there's like plumbing all over the walls, you know, like someone had to had to go in and like model all that stuff that like in the original game was just, was literally again just wallpaper. Um, you know, I just I really like the 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 sort of the meticulous work here of you know, you know, and if you if you side by side them like they're very they're very different but it's very it's very faithful i mean in addition to obviously like not being wallpaper right like you know the the interpretation is just wonderful um and I, I really wanted to, to call that out that after seeing after seeing that comment in the in the comments i really i really in the chat rather um i really liked it um you know and someone else was was mentioning um the ui work you did here um and it's you know it's funny like the 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 constraints that we were working under at the time right like um like we're the first the first first person 3d game i can think of that did that did crouching and leaning and looking up and down and stuff oh did i lose you no nope okay sorry we just had we're a all listening to your beautiful voice um and so like no one really knew how we were going to explain to the players that, that this was even a thing you could do and it was it was it was way before like anyone had developed the first mouse look. So sadly, we didn't have that to copy. Um, so we ended up with this. You know, for people who I don't I don't know if you have a, a mental picture of the original system shock, but there's this little this little figure in the UI that you could you could literally like grab the got the dude in the UI and drag him around to change your posture in addition to like the keyboard commands and everything. Like 
we, we erred so far on the side of just like surfacing all the players' options on the HUD, um, which you know on the one hand I you know I've heard some people say that like they really appreciate how how thematic that like cyber interface look in that game is, but man, it was busy. Oh um, yeah, it takes up a lot of screen space. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it definitely did. Um, uh, and I that's a you know one of the one of the challenges right again that. Uh, I've I've been watching you guys tackle with this game um, is you know honestly modernizing that because um, there's there's a lot of decisions that that you know if we had the the history of game development between then and now to to work with like we we probably would have made differently in, in terms of that the whole the whole front end user interface right so. Um, I, I recall in a in there's a dev stream with. Uh, some of the shock one devs um, playing through the game, and mm-hmm. I seem to recall Austin Grossman in that stream saying that if there is a game that doesn't have a fatigue system and three levels of clickable crouch, then it's a Mamby Pamby game that he doesn't want any part of. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Austin, yeah. <laughs> he is a hilarious dude. <laughs> Uh, can I just pause for a second and just take a quick break to tell everyone that we just hit $1.2 million in our Kickstarter uh, during this stream. So thank you, everyone who's watching. Thank you to all of you who have backed and helped us get this far. That has just unlocked the uh, stretch goal for localization in, uh, what is it, French, Italian, German, and Spanish? Awesome. I, I, I think there have been talks of adding... Uh, other very popular languages too but we can't i don't think we can confirm anything on those yet but anyway thank you guys so much for that uh, hmm? uh, i just uh i i had an important interruption uh somebody you interrupt uh, requested... my interruption oh no <laughs> uh, somebody requested to be brought into the channel ahead of schedule uh so everybody uh i'd like to introduce warren specter warren please introduce yourself and tell folks what you did on system shop Hey everybody, uh, I sure hope you can hear me because man, I've been having some audio problems. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, this is Warren Spector. I was the producer on the game, uh, which meant I worked out of the Origin office in Austin, Texas, and uh, traveled up to Boston to uh, to work with the team uh, as often as I could because it was way more fun working with the Looking Glass guys than it was uh, uh, working on most of the stuff I was working on in Austin. Um, and I just wanted to uh, address Tim's little story about <laughs> uh, there. There were actually okay. So here's the deal. We're like it, it wasn't weeks before um, we were done. It was like the day before we went beta, and, <laughs> and and it was it was moving Starfield, and uh, if I remember correctly, the rotating cameras. Both went in, and I, I was there with Harvey uh, at like two in the morning, and uh, you know he told me what was going on, and I was ready to fly up there that day and kill you guys. <laughs> uh, but then, but then I went in, I went into my office and I did a little happy dance, uh, because you, you know I mean that's that's what makes games great. It's those things that that you know, come in at the last minute that the team really burns to do. So I was really happily mad at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned all the, all those things that people put in last minute, and those are all the great things. I think you just described uh, our demo that we're playing here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now, this, this wasn't last minute. This was carefully thought out, planned, and we had to do everything from the beginning. Uh-huh. <laughs> Everything went smoothly and according to plan. Yep. Well, I just got to go on record saying I think uh, the, the game is looking great, and uh, you know, the just just I've always said that if we just updated the graphics and the UI and maybe the sound on System Shock, we would still have the state of the art in gaming, and I think you guys are proving it. And I don't know what that says about the rest of gaming. I'll leave that to other people to decide. Uh, but the, the word. <laughs> The, the word pathetic is coming to mind, but that's just me being a jerk, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Warren. We really appreciate yeah. that. We're reaching the end of the demo here, guys. Oh, no. Well, uh, we're 15 minutes away uh, from the System Shock 1 stuff. 
Um, so, I mean, we could just uh, share stories about development things that we faced and, I don't know, got any good war stories, Stephen? Good war stories. Bringing you on board is one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was... Yeah, that's hurt. <clears throat> No, I mean, I think that uh, the development of the demo was just um, was a lot smoother than I anticipated, um, especially as uh, Night Dive's first major foray into this space. Um, we just had the right people on board. We, I mean, we 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 looked to um, you know the original creators for for the inspiration, and I don't think we uh, we could have gone wrong. Um, Jeez, what else, man? What a what a trip this whole thing has been. Uh, like I said earlier, um, we started working on this um, about a year ago, um, just as a conceptual thing for our own um, kind of internal purposes, and um, being able to share it with everybody, whether or not they back the project or not on Kickstarter, I think um, really shows you know um, our commitment and our passion towards delivering something that that we all love and that we all uh, personally believe in and um yeah i just i i'm overwhelmed by the support you guys have given us and uh i just i i couldn't be more grateful yeah i don't think that there's anyone on the team who just does not or did not already love system shock too so i i think that's come through a lot and there's been a lot of you know discussions and debates among the team of how certain things should be handled and you know a lot of back and forth but it's always come from a place of you know people who are passionate about what we're doing and it, it's only coming from the place that we all have all loved this series for a long enough time to have that close of a relationship with it that we believe in it so much yeah I, I cannot tell you how gratifying it is just to, to, to see this happening as well I gotta say yeah, it's it's pretty funny. Uh, this is Horn again. Um, what it you know when uh, the IDOS Montreal guys said they were going to do um, uh, new Deus Ex games, uh, I, everybody asked me you know if I was mad about that or upset or anything. And I think they wanted me to be mad, um, but in the same way that with System Shock. Uh, all I feel is, you know, hey, it's it's like one of our babies grew up, you know, and is leaving home now. Uh, it is so cool to have been part of something that's bigger than yourself, uh, that has a life beyond you. There aren't many developers who can say that uh, that's happened to them. And uh, I've been lucky enough to have it happen. Wow, when Underworld Ascendant ships, it would be three times. Uh, so... Um, it'd be nice if more developers got to see that happen, see their, their you know, creations from 22 years ago uh, coming back with, uh, with new life. It's pretty exciting. So if System Shock is your baby that grew up, does that make us your sons-in-laws? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, think, I think you have, uh, hey, Tim, how big was the team? About 30 people. I think you have 35 so, uh, <laughs> oh man, Christmas is going to be crazy. <laughs> uh, it it really was. You know, there's a, a thing called uh, in business management circles called a gelled team, uh, and and I, I can't think of too many uh, that were more gelled. It, and, and it's a good thing, by the way, uh, more gelled than the System Shock team. It was pretty amazing, and it was it was a bunch of folks who came off of. Uh, Underworld uh, as their first project and a bunch of people who never worked on a game before so they didn't know what was impossible and I think that's one of the things that, that made the game uh, if, if I can say so on their behalf so great yeah it definitely broke uh, broke a lot of ground because they they didn't think that things were impossible you know they were putting in so many things that just weren't standardized at the time and so many hours. Don't forget that. There was, there there was a lot of work. We I remember uh, flying up there, uh, and uh, working with with folks on on story and and working on uh, bug tracking and everything. And there would be bug meetings at like two in the morning. It was it was pretty nutty. 
Yeah, lots of random familiar. futons thrown about the office that people would. Forget about the futons. What was that brown thing? <laughs> There, there oh. was some, there was some brown furniture-like thing in the office. That did, I, did I don't we, even want to think about it. Did we still have that weird fuzzy couch on in System Shock? Amen, brother. Oh man, we had that way back starting on on Unreal One, where like that was the the the, the, the napping couch, basically. Yes, I, I choose I choose not to think about all of the dead skin cells that were deposited in that thing. <laughs> 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 It was the 1970s. It was this like shag brown fuzzy couch thing. And it was it was yeah this like re, this like like tilted reclining. I can't even explain this. this, this it was like it was like it was like one of those zero G you know couch chair things. I mean like I remember it being curved really strangely and being other than the disgusting factor. It was about the most comfortable thing I ever put my body. Yeah. No, it, it looks it like like from a distance it, it would look like one of those like one of those elegant divans that Roman nobles would <laughs> would would recline on to take their meals, and and from close up it looked like Chewbacca, <laughs> and smelled like him too. <laughs> and none of this has anything to do with the making of the new game. Oh, it totally does. It is relevant. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember how we got how we got on this topic, but I love it. <laughs> uh, you can just just call me the randomizer. That's okay. Uh, Daniel, can you go ahead and load up System Shock One, or yep, I guess sure finish yeah, the demo sure. and yeah. go to one. Speaking of random, I have one one little nugget that's stuck with me after all these years, as far as just like an experience I had with one of the programmers back then. Okay, sure. When I, uh, so I was originally doing the, um, did the artwork for the, for the pipe. And I remember um, Art Min asked me for a hand art for the uh, laser rapier. Be careful what you and, say, Art is lurking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm serious, he is lurking right now. Is Art here? Uh, this is, Art is, yes, yeah, this, he's lurking. This is good stuff. I, I'll never forget how mad he. I so I had never, you know, like I had never worked on a game. Had you know, pretty much no idea what I was doing. Um, so they asked me for the, you know, hand art for the laser rapier. So I basically I took the the lead pipe and I like colorized it like a glowing blue, and you know, but it was the same art. And you know, I figured, well, it's you know. It's a lightsaber. I'll just recolor this thing, and um, but it was not. I was not meaning to be lazy about it or anything. I just didn't know. You know, to me, it made sense. So anyway, like, I gave it to Art, and he implemented it. And next thing I knew, like, he was at my desk and just he was just fuming mad. And uh, I think it was he was mad because because when he you know it basically when you switch weapons from the pipe to the laser rapier, rapier, it basically looked like you were, you know, suddenly like the pipe like started glowing, you know, because it was the exact same art. <laughs> I don't think, I think anybody, was... go ahead. Well, I think he was mad at me because he thought I was being lazy, but it's like, I had no idea. I was just like, I don't know, how about this, you know? And, and I forget ultimately what I ended up doing, probably like changing the, you know, position of it or something, so it didn't like snap right into the right. exact, you know, position of the pipe. But uh, I just remember like, just how like, how mad he was and just like that. I don't think know. anybody cared once they started playing because that laser rapier was bad ass. But I, can, <laughs> I can totally see though, like exactly how that happened and exactly yeah. like that moment that you didn't anticipate of it like snapping. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I've been I've just been informed that we have another guest joining us. Uh, new guest, please introduce yourself and tell us what you did on System Shock. Um, this is Paul Nurath, and uh, I uh, I helped get the game off the ground. Did some early concept work and put the team together. Yeah, 
Hello? Uh -oh. All of a sudden, I'm hearing nothing. Uh-oh. <laughs> I had a really horrible feeling that my internet connection had gone down for a moment. Then. No, 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 it's not right. you, Daniel. Hello, are we back? Yeah, you're back. Alright. We had a little glitch there. A little glitch. Well, thank you for joining us. It's great to see uh, System Shock coming back. <laughs> Yeah, Paul, how, how long had, you know, before we met and before we started, um, you know, working together, um, how, I mean, how long ago was it in your plans to um, eventually do a System Shock 3? Um, well, we had, uh, it really started uh, after we did System Shock 2. Uh, the, you know, the plan was to move forward with it. Uh, but then... Uh, EA at that point uh, wasn't super interested in doing a new version uh, because the when System Shock 2 came out in 1999, uh, the sales weren't that great out the gate. And uh, then not long after, Looking, itself, Looking Glass itself folded, and so that created its own hurt, set of hurdles. Uh, so it, it, it was uh, it never really got traction. Uh, but you guys, you, you guys actually even did a, a concept. For it, right? I mean, there was a concept document. Yeah, but you know, very, very sketchy. Just sort of, here's what we might do. We we really didn't put any work into it back at that time. Oh, there's a comment about the floppy disk version. Oh my God, there 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 are stories about that too. Uh, we no one wanted to ship the floppy version, but. Uh, some company that we were working for that's already been named that we won't name uh, insisted that we we ship the game uh, in time for Christmas and that we had no choice if, if we had shipped the CD version first I, I think uh, uh, history might have been a little different yeah the CD Sorry, version is just... quite a bit better <laughs> yeah well I just saw that comment and had to throw that in there it wasn't it wasn't like the team wanted to uh, wanted to ship it uh, on floppies. I mean, I mean, like it must have been on seven floppies or some craziness like that. I don't know. I think nine, right? Yeah. Um, that so that kind of brings up another question that I had for you guys, which was, um, you know, during this time, you know, it was kind of like the age of doom, right? I mean, it was the 900-pound gorilla in the room. And you were creating an experience that was, you know, from the first person perspective, it was very similar, but you know, everything else is completely different. What was your, I mean, did you have a strategy back then on how to kind of differentiate yourself from that enough to garner, um, you know, its own interest? Well, sure. I mean, I think if you look at, um, you know, the, uh, the, the origin, uh, blue sky looking glass game style uh, we were always after something different uh, there I don't think there was anybody who even had any interest in making a game like doom uh, or Wolfenstein you know underworld shipped before Wolfenstein so the first person uh, genre was was kind of created by 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 guys like Paul um, and we always wanted to create what we called uh, we called them immersive simulations not shooters Um you know, where, where there was nothing that dragged you out of the game world. But there was something more going on than just kill everything that moves. Uh, we wanted, we wanted you know, to empower players to tell their own story. That's what it's been about uh, from the start and uh, what we've all been trying to do ever since. Do you have any good examples of games that you feel, uh, modern games, uh, have taken a lot of pages out of your book when it comes to immersive sims? And done well, the, well. Ar the, ar the arcane guys. I mean, clearly, uh, that's that's like half of them worked on on my old Ion Storm team. Uh, they're I think they're doing a, a terrific job. Um, beyond that, I think there are a lot of people doing things that are kind of kissing cousins of, of what we used to do. But uh, like, I mean, if you look at, at Bethesda and uh, you know the stuff that uh, that Peter Molyneux was doing, uh, the Bioware guys, there are people who are doing things sort of sort of like what we were doing, but uh, I describe those as being simulated uh, an inch deep and miles wide, and what uh, what we were trying to do was simulate smaller spaces. You know, op 
open worlds in corridors, so you know, simulated an inch wide and miles deep, uh, which I can't speak for Tim and Paul, but I find that much more interesting uh, than just letting you explore an enormous world where you know every 10 minutes you're being reminded that you're just playing a game. I'm never going to work again. This is pretty cool. <laughs> You've been saying that for a long, long time, though, Warren. Uh, that's, that's true, but someday it's going to come true, and I'll, I'll look like a, a, a seer, you know? <laughs> No, I mean, how did you guys feel about it? You guys were, were, were you even thinking about Doom when you were working on System Shock? I mean, I sure wasn't. I could have cared less. Yeah, not really. I mean, I remember we we saw, uh, you know, the, the demo of it came out while we were still working on System Shock. Uh, you know, uh, I know James had some ideas about the, the, the lighting model they were using that was actually um, actually giving some, some, them some trouble at the time of the demo, uh, but... It was, they were just trying to solve a very different set of problems in many ways. Yeah, I just think it's interesting because, you know, it, it came out around the same time. And, um, you know, obviously Doom has its own legacy. Um, but, you know, I've, re I've read a couple of books on the subject. And it seems like, you know, based on their original designs, they were almost kind of going for something more like System Shock. Like if Adrian Carmack had had his way, he would have added in you know, a narrative element that was a lot stronger, um, ancillary characters that you could talk to or that you would, you know, learn backstory from, that kind of thing. Um, so the, just the dynamic between the two has just always been very interesting to me. So well, it's, no, it's no big surprise that, that <laughs> other companies have had trouble uh, convincing people with money to let them do stuff like System Shock. I, I mean, I remember um, uh, going to a, a product review meeting where they're, Every quarter there was a product review meeting where all of the games in development would be, were shown to executives. And I think it was June or July. Remember, remember System Shock on the, the, the crummy floppy version shipped in September. Uh, and what was that, 94, I guess? And in June or July of that year, I went and showed System Shock to the executive team. And it almost got killed. <laughs> People did not get it at all, and and it, it took some arguing uh, to to keep it alive. And, and thank God, thank God, it, you know the, they finally backed down. But it's it's tough to convince people to to you know support a game that's um, part shooter, part survival horror, part role playing game, unlike any role playing game anybody's ever made. You know, and, and frankly, anybody makes today. Uh, it's it's a tough sell because the marketing people didn't know what to do with it. Whereas, oh, blue door, go find blue key, kill blue monster, get blue key, open blue door. I mean, that's easy. So that kind of brought up another question that um, just been kind of milling around for a while um, since we started working on this. Were there any? Was there anything back then in '94 that you wanted to do? Um, in System Shock that the technology um, just wasn't capable of delivering. Well, it sure wasn't moving Starfield. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, a, a curved surface would have been nice. <laughs> I yeah, maybe, about that. maybe System Shock 3 will have some curved surfaces. <laughs> Uh, boy, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I mean, it, it had a haiku at the end. What work could you want? <laughs> Actually, one 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 huge thing, which is you know, I think I think maybe today you could you could do it, but you know the the uh, the whole the whole design of the the character of Shodan, you know, sprung out of you know kind of an aspirational thing that we knew you know I think was 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 not going to be realized in that form, but like the thing we were really aspiring to was the feeling that there was actually, you know, an intelligent adversary agent, you know, really acting against you and monitoring what you were doing. Um, and I actually think these days that's probably a, a doable like game AI project. And it might um, happen in some near, near future game. You never know. And hit. Um, 
but you know, like at the time, it was all smoke and mirrors, right? Like we, you know, the 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 use of the security cameras to get the sense of of omnipresence to Shodan, the the sort of design practice of of playing cruel practical jokes on the player and blaming them on Shodan, you know, like all of that was just like these sort of tricks to to achieve that that you know, some sense of that aspiration. The the interesting thing for me is, I, I think the fact that everybody's dead is is really wonderful and part of what uh, what makes System Shock, System Shock. But, um, Paul, I don't know if you're, maybe your memory is different. I have a very vivid memory of you, me, and Doug Church in my office in Austin talking about, and two, two things came up. One was, oh my God, if I ever have to make another fantasy game again, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> that was that was that was one, and the other one was we have no idea how to do a decent conversation system. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then somebody, I don't remember who it was, somebody came up with the idea. Let's let's just kill everybody. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it was both of those. And you know, I think I think we're finally ready to do another fantasy game, but uh, <laughs> we're still we're still talking about the unsolved problem of decent conversation systems. And it's it's something that comes up pretty much every day here as we're working on System Shock Three too. It's uh, you know how how true is is would it be to the System Shock universe if everybody wasn't dead? I just really I hope that there's some journalist watching this and it will be quoted, Warren Spector. I think the fact that everyone is dead is great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's the, the, it's so baked into what System Shock is now. It's, it's it's hard to imagine a System Shock where there's living living humans around you. But uh, you know, it did feed into the whole horror genre that much more. So that was a that was also a win. Um, but yeah, we we've been playing with conversation systems with uh, the Underworld games and just not that happy with it. You know, it felt contrived. Um, and I'd argue that today conversation systems are still no, no one's really solved them elegantly. It's still a somewhat contrived scheme. We've made no progress since 1989, except we've attached a timer to a branching church. I, th I think the text fonts are quite a bit nicer now. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. And, and once again, I am drawn back to the word pathetic. Because of the state of conversations today. Right. The, the other thing that I think, you know, having, uh, moving to the, you know, audio logs that you would find uh, really fed into the sense of, you know, you're, you're, as you're exploring the space, you feel as a player that you're piecing together the, the, the backstory, you know, based on your actions and what you're doing. And uh, that, that was just a, a, it felt very differently somehow than stumbling onto an NPC who just sort of spouted stuff yeah. to you. It's, it, it actually might, it might be a little hard to explain to, you know, some of the newcomers to the to the to the game, right? Because it really was a, a very novel thing at the time, and, and yet, like this notion of, of of scavenging these audio logs has become such a trope since then. Like that's one of the things that, like, I think you can point straight back to System Shock, and um, for all the things that were not adopted, like that idea is like very commonplace now to the point where, yeah, you know, I've seen it parodied and 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 such, and and you know, that's that's. It's kind of, kind of almost a challenge of like, I don't know, like maybe System Track is the only game that like is, is is still allowed to do that without without being parodied. At least you know I hope I hope we still I, I hope I hope that that the, the the well hasn't been poisoned for us if if we have to like go back there. But it's just it's just hard to imagine System Shock without you know story elements coming to you uh, out of order and forcing players to involve themselves in the story by piecing it together. It's it's in, it's very hard to imagine System Shock without that. But, you know, one, one of my favorite things uh, in the first game was, uh, I wish I could remember the details. You, you know, given that I just played it, I should remember this, but there was one place where you actually heard from, from people who are still alive. You got a log from people who are still alive. And it, there was just this feeling of, oh my God, if I can just get to them in time, I can save them. And of course you're you're too late, you know. Yeah. And it, that was that was a really tragic moment for me. Yeah, that's that's a trick we get to pull that once and probably never again. Yeah, that that one that one we're done with. 
You know, I still think Although, that, like, uh, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying about, you know, the sort of the non, the non-linear, like, presentation of the story and like piecing you know, you're sort of doing like this archaeology on the station right but uh, i still i sometimes feel like the like the story ends up like still too coherent like like someone should should be watching more rashomon before <laughs> before working on this stuff and like people have these like completely different perspectives and disagreements and everyone's like what the hell actually is going on i've always wanted to make a rashomon game that it's set in high school that that would be the answer <laughs> A hush fell over the crowd. <laughs> so Rob, I have a question for I have a question for Rob. Um, What's up? You, uh, I, I seem to recall a little while ago we were talking and you mentioned um, because I was asking you about um, inspiration for the art style for the game um, because I was looking for it for sound effects too. Uh, do, I know you mentioned uh, a lot of sort of classic sci-fi movies. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Your artistic inspiration for the game. Um, well, I guess they're, in my mind, they're just sort of typical go-tos as far as, you know, um, the original Alien, um, and that sort of thing. But I think at the time, I mean, the look, when I got there, the look was, you know, there was some levels, um, established i think for system shock and i think my first impression of it was you know it was coming across to me very star trek and um more so in the beginning and i think i think it sort of you know um we tried to i i do recall like the, a lot of the levels were you know in fact all the textures were pristine um and looked, you know, like sort of you were on the 60s, you know, Star Trek ship. Um, and then I remember, um, I remember Warren, you know, actually was like, we need to like, you know, we need to fuck up these textures, you know, we need to like, you know, they should look dirty or dinged, you know. So we basically went back and um, started like, um, distressing all the textures, you know, like baking in, um, you know, like dings and rust and, you know, wires being like, you know, implied that they were sticking out of the wall and that sort of thing. Um, and then that really started to, you know, take on a life of its own as far as setting up the atmosphere. Like this place is just really sort of in shambles, you know, as, as opposed to its former glory. There were a bunch of pretty genius things that, that Tim and, and guys like him did on those levels. Uh, I mean, the, the, the feeling of being in a real place was pretty amazing. Like you could go into a room and, and kind of have a sense of what that room's purpose was. It wasn't just a collection of random spaces. Uh, I thought that was, that was one of the things I loved about it. Uh, also, that feeling of, of claustrophobia you got. I mean, most shooters, they're big open spaces, you know, with, with cover points and, 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 you know, things above you and stuff so you can get tactical advantages and everything. In System Shock, it was like, I am running down a, a narrow corridor, and if I keep running and I run around that corner, something is going to kill me. Uh, there was this real sense of... Uh, of, of having to kind of slow down and and be scared, uh, which I thought was just amazing. I mean, that's one of the ways in which it's most unlike uh, most shooters. It's it's not a game where you you move forward like a shark and eventually, if you keep doing that, you win. It's you really have to stop and think and listen uh, and figure out where the threats are and not go barreling around corners at top speed unless you're on those silly skates, which I always thought. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think that that a lot of those the lessons that we learned about that that style and that pacing on System Shock would later influence on influence us on Thief, you know, uh, in terms of like the power imbalance and the way that 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 uh, drives you towards a certain play style. Um, 
I also think you know Rob's comment and your and your own Warren both sort of reminded me of a, a question I saw on the on the chat earlier about uh, someone was asking like oh what what's with all these you know uh, you know discarded soda cans and and the severed limbs and stuff and you know that that kind of serves a, like a couple of purposes uh, you know none of them like really functional in the game except for like I'll leave a spoiler about one of the severed body parts um, but you know. Oh and, no, he's about to reveal a spoiler and dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> and like many and, and more lived in, right? You know? Like not everything has not every not everything in the world is there just for the player to interact with, which I think you know is, is part of part of making it feel, you know, a, a sense of like real presence and, and again, like it's a lived in space. So what was the spoiler about the the uh, severed limb? Uh, a severed body part, not a severed limb. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think probably most people have had this spoiled for them already about 20 years ago, but I'm still going to be respectful. <laughs> Do you guys have any stories about how um, like cyberspace was conceived? Poorly? <laughs> I... I guess like just you know the maybe the inspiration behind it or well sure i mean there was a lot of the there was it was it was very much sort of in the in the you know, the, the the times that yeah you know, at that time like there was a lot of a lot of interest in 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 cyberpunk like you know and and you have to you have to remember as well like this was like just at the dawn of like computers becoming like a real presence in everyday life uh, and so it's it's kind of natural that cyberpunk was 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 coming along with that. Um, I know I know a lot of that was uh, was Doug's influences. He you know, he he was a big fan of 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 you know, some of the the early cyberpunk literature. Um, uh, I think, gosh, I'm trying to remember my timeline. Was this game? No, it, this this game must have been post Max Headroom because I remember like Greg cited that as like one of the influences on on Showdown's audio style, right? Yeah. Um, so there was this like very particular like sort of vision of what like it, what it might be like to to sort of navigate information um, in in the future, um, and you know there were different versions of that which I think you, know, you sort of we, we ended up sort of synthesizing from, you know, a combination of those influences and, and, and what was actually technically possible. Like a lot of this, a lot of this, you know, springs from, from the limitations of, of the platform at the time, right? Like you can imagine going someplace with this other than that, like very clean polygonal look that's in cyberspace. Uh, but boy, it, that, that choice certainly made things a lot simpler for us. Well, um, but it was, it was also, uh, I mean, was it the, First freeform 3D space. It might oh, have been of, like the, the fact that like you you were sort of tumbling in in six degrees of freedom and everything. Yeah. It might have. I mean, like in terms of like PC games, probably there there. I'm sure there were like arcade game Des predecessors and stuff. Uh, when, when did Descent come out? Descent was definitely. Uh, I'm almost sure Descent was later. Was it later? Yeah. Okay. Was, it I, was. I think so. It was yeah. in that time frame, but it may be not. But yeah, and you know, and so I mean, before that, like the 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 that that I mean, oh, really you can definitely point back at, at 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 space games. Like we were all familiar with Wing Commander, and Paul had done Space Rogue, right? Um, so in terms of like moving through the space, there was that familiar point of reference. But but the you know the visual the visual like marrying that with a particular visual design. That I think that the, I think that visual design came out of you know a lot of stuff that was in in like genre fiction back in the 90s you know yeah i just wish it had been a little less shootery you know sure. i mean it 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 still felt like it, it felt in fact more like you were playing a shooter than most parts of the game right well i mean i, I think there was an earlier question about what what didn't we weren't we able to do as well as we wanted to or get far enough along on the original system shock and i think you know cyberspace didn't fully flesh out the way we intended um, yeah, I think everyone had aspirations to develop that more fully than, than yeah, we did. Yeah. If you could go back to it now, how 
what would you do differently? How would you have the player interact with that space and that, you know, that particular mechanic of the game? If I told you, I'd have to kill you. Because <laughs> we're trying to figure it out, too. <laughs> hey, don't don't be stealing my thunder, pal. <laughs> Well, I mean, I will say, like, the, the, the thing that's fundamentally, like, very limited about cyberspace in the original System Rock 1, right? Like, it's, it really is all, all moving and shooting, mostly moving. It's like, it's primarily just a flying game, right? So, you know, there's, there, like, any kinds of, of interactions with the environment around you that are, are at all, at all richer than just, like, you know, flying through things and pointing at them, like, the, 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 the options are really wide open as far as as far as that goes. You could you could do a lot with it. My mouth is shut. Yeah, no, you know, like, I know. I haven't already had these these conversations with with Warren, so I, I know I can't spoil anything. But uh, but uh, yeah. How about that elevator music, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard the? the version that we've done of the elevator music? No, but it's coming back for System Shock 3. That's a must. You got Showdown, to... Showdown Citadel Station and the elevator music. I think the, maybe, the elevator maybe music... Maybe even not updated. I think the elevator music is half the reason that I that I, that I I pulled that trick where like the you open the elevator and there's a, and there's a robot warrior like waiting for you. Like <laughs> first, first we train you to get completely complacent about the elevators and and then we screw you for it. Whereby we, I mean, I did that. <laughs> yeah, John. When when this is done, you have to uh, <clears throat> make sure to send them your your, uh, your version of the elevator music. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. <laughs> I don't know. I I basically just love the the uh, the music. I won't say the audio necessarily, but I love the music in System Shocks One to this day. Yeah, obviously it's primitive, and we can do better in terms of fidelity. But it that that music, I mean, just captured cyberpunk so perfectly for me uh, at the time, and it still works. It's kind of crazy, or not? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 that's that's totally legit, uh, and it is. It's hard to, it's, it's it's one of those things that. You know, due to the the like what audio hardware let us do at the time, it's it's a it's it doesn't necessarily age well, right? Um, you have to you have to like you have to hear it in the context of like what was even possible, right? And and it's one of those things that like like graphics can can be hard to get a sense of of you know how it um, how it compared to state of the art at the time, right? But, uh, but yeah, I, I you know, uh, that was, this, was this, this was, was this Greg's work or who did the music? I forget now. I think it was Greg. Greg LaPiccolo, right? Yeah. The fans can probably verify. <laughs> okay, they, they know more about these games than we do. Yeah. Yep, they're confirming. There you go. Uh, Daniel, how many times have you played through the original System Shock? Too many. <laughs> Too many, that's healthy. No, no uh, such thing. I was going to say, I'm like, I'm really enjoying watching you play through this. You're just cranking through it. It's like you've done it before. <laughs> oh, maybe this guy will be your friend. Uh, no. <laughs> It doesn't actually matter what part of the game you're at. I can say maybe this guy will be your friend and it'll be false. <laughs> I have to say, playing through it today, there I it, I was uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but I, I was as I was playing, I was emailing back and forth with uh, with Doug Church, and I sent him an email. The first one was, "Oh my God, this game is hard," and his response was, "1994," and. Then my, my next email was, oh my god, this game is big. And his response was, 1994. And then my <laughs> response was, oh my god, what were we thinking with this UI? 
you can re- you can I'll let you fill in what his response was. <laughs> uh, uh, but I it, I had I don't think in fact I know I hadn't played the game since since probably 1995, and uh, it was uh, eye opening. It, it was very much a what were we thinking kind of kind of experience. So uh, I'm very happy to see you guys doing what you're doing with it. Were you using the version that had um, the mouse look mod, or were you going? You oh know, yes, classic oh, yes. mode. No, 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 no. Mouse look didn't help. Yeah, it's 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 hard for me to play this game anymore without. Them. It looks like we have uh, somebody uh, in the channel. Uh, Alexander Brandon is joining us. Hey, Alex. Alex, say something. Well, it's 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 delayed by twenty seconds, so he'll he'll, he'll get around to it hopefully. Oh, okay. Uh, do you guys see anything that's going on in the level that brings up memories or anything in particular? You guys want to talk about? Nothing's moving in the video for me, so the answer is oh. you no. Know. I'm 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 noticing that the omnipresent, um, or at least. It, the, the screens of, it's hard it's actually hard to tell at the pixel resolution that system shock was at but the, like those those screens of Edward Diego's face where, <laughs> of course every all the all the all the, the, the people practically all the people in the game were actually like employees at Google Glass, right so the, the the face of Edward Diego was 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 co-founder Ned Lerner and I think the the voice was Austin Grossman <laughs> something like that. So has you probably can't say, but has Austin signed on with you guys yet? Is he you guys out in any capacity? Um, I, I think Austin's uh, uh, pretty busy at Magic Leap these days. Yeah, last I heard. Yeah, I think I think uh, on System Shock Three, I'll be uh, I'll be peppering him with uh, with with documents and questions and. And all, but it's all going to be, I suspect, on a volunteer basis. So, is there anything that you guys can share with us about System Shock Three, or is that pretty much? Uh, well, you know, at this now. point, at this point, there's there's not much to share, right? I mean, until uh, a week and a half ago, it was me alone in the room. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Uh, and now it's uh, it's it's four of us, so we're having lots of brainstorming sessions about what we what we uh, you know what about the, the setting, the game systems, what we want to update, what we want to do that's new. Um, you know, I have I have a rule on any game I work on that you have to be able to answer the question: What's the one new thing? What's what's the thing that no one in the world's ever seen or done in a game before? So we're we're kind of hammering that out, figuring out where where we want to take our risks. Um, you know, going through um, uh, forums to see what people liked and didn't like about the old games. I mean, not that not that you know the the audience is going to design the game, but it's it's always good to know what people what people think. Um, we're trying to figure out what prototypes we're going to build. What are the most important things we need to do? Because uh, I mean, we're we're starting with um, there's there's a great deal of fiction set up in, in System Shock and System Shock Two clearly set up a, a lot of uh, sequel possibilities. Let's just say, um, but we are really starting with a, an empty hard drive uh, and and empty heads uh, in the best possible way. Um, so um, you know there isn't there isn't a lot to say. I, I think I've said pretty much everything I, I want to say in saying that. Showdown will appear, Citadel Station will appear in some form, and the elevator music is damn well going to be there. And there will be a hidden basketball court. Yay! <laughs> Always has to be the basketball. Always has to have, to have a basketball court. Um, I was, I was, I have to say, I was disappointed. They put a, they put a basketball in, in Fallout 4, which was very sweet of them, but it's just, it's not, it's not bouncy enough. It's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing more disappointing than a flaccid bas- basketball. Try, try it in uh, 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 Disney Epic Mickey. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I think it took me like 45 minutes to make a basket in uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution. <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> oh, and 451 will appear somewhere. Oh, yeah, of course. And that started with System Shock 2, and now now it's like every uh, every game that comes out of that tradition has to include 451, you know? Uh, and it's it's funny. I mean, this is this is not directly System Shock related, but I remember Paul mentioned you know when when Looking Glass went out of business, um, there were, obviously that was a sad moment, and there was a lot of sturm und drang in the in the game development community and in the game game playing community. But I I have to admit there was a little part of me that that actually thought you know this is going to be a good thing um, because instead of one studio embodying this this incredible game style that everybody from looking glass was going to scatter it's going to be like um, a dandelion in the wind you know and all well, of these or another analogy might be kind of like shodan going out and infecting many many <laughs> <laughs> but but now you, you do see more people trying to do the kinds of things that uh, that looking glass was doing and you know i'll let other people decide how well they're doing it, but but there's, you know, there are people from Looking Glass at Bethesda now, and, and obviously irrational. And there are just, you know, uh, Ion Storm and Junction Point, and they're, we're all over the place, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. and, and that might be more impactful than one company making uh, amazing, uh, innovative games. Well, and it's it's surprising to me how many of how many of us are are you know still still like very active in the in the industry and of course you know most most people who are unless they you know took some significant hiatus are you know either either very senior people in their companies or you know like some of us like are are in a position from their prior experience where like we can do the, like this, this interesting indie stuff right and um you know and then you know, you know this industry like it's it's remarkable at lots of companies if you last five years before you decide to get out of the whole industry right but but uh, you know the the on the whole the the, the looking glass diaspora like you know is really been pretty persistent. Well, it's like I always say, what what else am I qualified to do? <laughs> <laughs> Getting distracted watching game. <laughs> Well, I have a list of questions I can go through. Well, for well, well, there's, here's another thing. Okay, so this is another one. Paul, Paul and Tim, ch check me on this, because I have a very vivid memory that I've probably completely imagined. Um, but I remember uh, Doug was down here. Doug Church was down here in Austin at one point, and we were at the Texas Chili Parlor. I can still remember exactly what table we sat at. And... And we started, you know, we were just like leaning on a on, on one arm and just said, why haven't you ever been able to do that in a game? And I don't know if that's where the idea of leaning came from or if it was just something that was already in Doug's head because you guys didn't talk about it or what. But that's my memory is that's where the lean came from. It, we were just we were we were eating really spicy chili uh, and lamenting the sad state of uh, first person shooters at the time. It's, it's as good a story as any. I mean, they, they were certainly, and I don't know whether it was after that or before that, there was discussion because we were trying to create these claustrophobic environments of tight, twisty, you know, uh, corridors. And so it seemed natural to be able to kind of lean around corners and, you know, sneak peeks and that kind of thing. Yeah, I remember also we, we had, we, I remember clearly having discussions like way back on Underworld about, you know, the fact that in Underworld, you know, you could, you could look up and down, which like no other game could do, and it actually mattered because the floor wasn't all at the same level, um, and there was there was like very little done with what the possibilities of the camera were, um, and you know the, certainly like the leaning and crouching stuff in System Shock does so much more with just camera motion to give you a sense of having a body. Uh, I you know I, I I I can't help but think that like that 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 thread of discussion that we had uh, had a lot to do with with uh, with going going that direction. Yeah, pre presence presence before VR was invented. 
just for hey and you know i mean a lot of people don't remember we we fully supported the cybermax and forte vfx one uh vr headsets and those um, were awesome pieces of hardware <laughs> oh my god well hey we, we also supported uh, them in wings of glory a flight sim i did around the same time and there was one time i went down into uh, the qa and the lead tester was testing wings of glory and we had to yank I won't say which one, but we had to yank one of them off his head because it was on fire. <laughs> That's wow. and but but the thing was, you could play through all of System Shock in VR, except the resolution was so low you couldn't read any of the text. You know, and I mean, like none of none of the UI text, uh, nothing, and and so it kind of made it a suboptimal experience. Oh yeah, but I mean those. When you those were those headsets were so primitive, but you know, um, there was just like there's so many rounds of like people like trying to 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 make it like time for VR to happen before this latest round where it looks like it might actually do. Um, hey, did I did I ever tell you like the um, about like later I would I would I would meet Karthik Bala who I, I would work at, I would work with uh, work for at Vicarious Visions. He was one of the he and his brother were the co-founders of that company, and and uh, I didn't I didn't remember this, but like back on System Shock, like he at that time he was an he was an intern for like VFX, I think it was. It might have been one of the other people, but like so like he was actually working with Doug on on those on those headset ports for System Shock. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah, man. Yeah, that was a good way to get sick too. <laughs> 20 plus hours of gameplay with a VR headset on your head. Um, there, you know, even today, there are people who think that's the right answer. I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a solved problem. <laughs> no. So did someone say they had questions? Oh, just when, when you guys uh, run out of things to talk about, I have a list of questions to kind of ignite more commentary and also questions from the Twitch stream. Uh, one of the questions is, um, so Warren, uh, you're a producer on System Shock, but have done so much more in the industry. Uh, from System Shock days, uh, working as a producer, how would you describe your, your transition into taking on more roles or, and, and just how has that journey been? And also how's that interaction been just through Looking Glass in general? Well, y you know, it's funny. I, I always tell people don't, don't model your career after mine, because uh, I was lucky enough to get into the, the business. I mean, it was, I, I started in electronic games in 1989. Uh, and I, nowadays, roles are very clearly defined. I mean, producers do a certain thing, and, you know, non producers do other things. But at the time, I was able to carve out a space of, you know, being a creative producer where I, I always had input into the creative on the projects that, that I was working on. Um, so I, there, there hasn't been that much of a transition other than um, in my previous life, there was always someone else who had one more vote than me. <laughs> and now I'm the guy with one more vote than everybody on the project all combined. <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of the biggest transition. Um, and uh, often it's like I can't I can't say that System Shock was my vision or Underworld was my vision. That would be obscene of me to claim that. Um, but I, I've gotten to the point where you know the the projects that I work on, uh, I don't even do real work on them. All I do is say, here's the game we're making, guys, go. You know. Um, but uh, that's that's been a big change. That I'm I'm uh, the instigator, I guess, uh, of. Uh, of various games uh that's that's been the biggest thing but uh everybody at looking glass i mean it was you know okay here's here's the thing about looking glass and, and blue sky um there's there's a guy named warren bennett who's a management uh, professor and, and and studier and he has this idea that he calls the great group which is a, a group of people all united by a singular vision. Um, they, they have their own language, like salt the fries and 
frobbing and you know scuffing your coat. They have their own language. They dress a certain way. They have a very distinct culture. They have an us versus them kind of mentality in a, in a good way. And uh, Blue Sky and Looking Glass had that that kind of mentality. Um, and once you've been a part of something like that, it, it's it's hard to go back. I've I've had I've been lucky enough to be a part of of, of that kind of experience uh, twice, and the System Shock team was one of them. I mean that team was. I mean I'm, you know they're every game and every team is is full of strife and you know people arguing and everything, but but there was a feeling at Looking Glass that you know. And, and it was it was true at Origin too, where where there was this feeling that we were going to change the world, and you know why doesn't everybody make games like this? And that was really special. I, I'll tell you just one one more story, and then I'll shut up. Um, the first time, as a show. Well, I I uh, I I was working with the Underworld team, and they they worked uh, most of the time, well for, until the end, uh, out of out of one house, right? They, uh, called Deco Morona, the house of 10 dumb guys. And I'll never forget the first time I walked into that house and realized that I was the stupidest person in the room. <laughs> and, and it was such a great feel. I mean, it was, it was really amazing being a part of that, you know? Uh, and that's part of what made Looking Glass so special. It was everybody, everybody was really freaking smart and wanted to change the world which didn't answer your question at all I but but tough I'll, I'll deal with it uh so paul and tim uh similar questions so from a design standpoint how have you found that changing over the years in the industry and, and just on on both of your roads through it and feel free to attack it in, in any order since you both are on the same microphone um well, for me, probably the transition—it's—it's it's not really a big transition because it's—it's, it's, you know, been having a, a, an independent studio, you know, Looking Glass at least for most of it. It's, uh, time certainly when we were making System Shock was an independent studio, uh, so, you know, my my role was more about trying to, you know, get a new project going, uh, uh, pull together, you know, a team that that you know was the right team for it and cohesive and had a vision and kind of getting out of their way for the most part um and you know at some level that hasn't changed <laughs> uh now at other side um so i think I, I, paul I was, you're uh, paul you're setting selling yourself a little short. yeah but I, mean, I, I didn't go through a transition I and mean, I, when i started in the games industry i was a uh, you know doing games on my own pretty much uh where i was trying to pretend i was an artist even though i had no talent as an artist and you know, doing the engineering and the design, and um, you know that that worked okay in the 1980s. But as the industry started to grow, it, it grew beyond you know certainly my skills to do a game, and it became clear that we needed you know needed to have a team uh, to do the, the the kind of games that we wanted to do. Um, so that was really the major transition that I went through from from being a, a solo indie game developer to you know having you know, a studio and, and, and finding really talented people to make the games. Cool. Um, I, I'm trying to think about it, like, I don't know, I'm not even sure if I'm, if I'm answering the question, but I, you know, I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, um, for me, like the, the interesting thing, looking back for, from, you know, from Looking Glass through, you know, where I've been since to here, um, you know, the, the, the places I've been at have been very different and each of them is like really, I think, I've been looking for different things at different places and they've added different things, right? Like Looking Glass, like, uh, yeah, I, I really have to agree with, with, with Warren. There was, there was, uh, you know, so much, so much, like just like general concordance of like what our mission was and also just like real genius uh, um, in the room, like, like a tremendously talented group of people. Um, at the same time, like, I, th I think it wasn't probably it probably wasn't unique to Looking Glass at the time because like this was you know in the '90s and the, the the industry is still kind of in its infancy and trying to figure out like what the roles even were and what the processes should be, um, and so after Looking Glass folded, I was like really looking for answers to those questions, um, 
and ending up at at Vicarious Visions, which at the at the time it was like this small independent studio that like mainly did like Game Boy Advance games actually, and would later like grow tremendously and become uh, one of the larger Activision subsidiaries. They're still active and they're doing they're uh, they're doing every other year's uh, Skylanders game. Uh, but the thing that like was they really had going for them, um, and and I, I I can only I can only take from the results they get that they still do, is craft. I mean that that is like such a button down shop where like they are they are disciplined and they go back and like really understand their process and like what happened on each project, um, and so like that sense that sense of of process and craftsmanship like was something that was like really only developing in the industry. Uh, and that I really felt like I got from them. Uh, but then, like, you know, uh, you know, after that, going to going to Harmonix, which, again, like, such a such a talented group of people, but, like, not in the not in the things that, like, I was really familiar with, you know, working on music games there. I really had to stretch myself. Um, and so, like, every place I've been has, has sort of added something, like, really distinct uh, on, on my sort of journey. Yeah, the one thing I'll tell you you never want to do is uh, grow your studio to 200 people internally and have 800 people working on a project. Uh, that was uh, this is the epic Mickey two for me. And yeah. when you're when you're doing something like that, you get so far from the project that and from the team that it, it really wasn't much fun for me. So I mean that's one of the reasons why um, when Junction Point shut down, I went and. and did some teaching for three years just to, you know, clear my head. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited now part of the other side, uh, working on System Shock 3, because we're not going to get that big and I'm not going to get that far from the project ever again. Uh, so you ask how things have changed over time. Um, you know, I went from being a creative producer, uh, ultimately to being someone who, who basically just runs the studio. And that's, that's not as much fun. So uh, System Shock 3 is already more fun than I've had in years. It's great. It's good that you can go back to that. Well, I, I owe that to Paul. I mean, you know, he, he, uh, he told me one day that, uh, that uh, he had the rights to make a System Shock 3 game. And I half jokingly said, hey, you know, I, I should make that for you. And about two weeks later, he called me back and said, "You know, you should make that one." And uh, it, it, the, the rest is well, the beginning of history, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, I can... Any I other gonna, questions? I was gonna say, um, you know, when when I initially started talking with Star back in, you know, the end of 2012. Um, there was this little glimmer of hope that I had that uh, one day we'd all be discussing this. So it's it's good to hear that uh, you guys feel the same way. <laughs> but you're just your general excitement and enthusiasm for for revisiting this franchise and just you know kind of picking up where you left off. Well, and, and the the amazing thing is that people still remember and care. You know it. I, I felt that way when, when Deus Ex hit its 15th anniversary. And I think I did more, more press at, on its 15th anniversary than I did when the game came out. And it's, it's kind of the same thing with System Shot, you know? It's like people still remember and care. And Underworld, same thing. How many people, how many games do people still care about from that long ago? Like the answer is like none, <laughs> you know? So we're really lucky. Yeah, right. It's it's I I, I can't account for it. <laughs> that might just be my imposter syndrome kicking in, though. You worked on something really special, too. Oh, you guys, so, so. group hug. I have feels. <laughs> Major feels. <laughs> but, you know, we've seen this in other media. I mean, the, the, the original, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings books. Uh, it took a while before they really caught on broadly. Um, I mean, they're out there for what twenty years, um, something like that. Uh, this the Star Trek series, you know, the original one had a th th three-year, you know. Yeah, they didn't make their five-year mission. They didn't make their five-year mission, and I think at the time, you know, uh, probably most of the the world didn't really notice it going. 
Um, so I, I think there's just certain in, 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 in entertainment, there's certain, you know, stories, characters, whatever it is that, that somehow stick, but you don't necessarily realize it when they first come out. Um, it's only some years later that, that sort of they, they get the momentum. Uh, it's cool when it happens. Yeah, I guess the, the thing for me and Steven on the reverse side of it is, I mean, we we grew up playing these games and now we're working on one and that in itself is mind blowing and now we're we're chatting with you guys about it and and collaborating steven how, how does that feel from your perspective um i don't know if there's a word to describe it uh otherworldly um how about other sidely <laughs> <laughs> okay there it is <laughs> Um, it's just, it's just crazy. I mean, um, this is totally going to date me, but I remember, you know, the day that I was in middle school and one of my friends came in and, um, <clears throat> handed me the box to System Shock and said, Hey, you have to play this. This is, this is incredible. And then going home that night and basically playing, you know, for 12 hours straight, um, and experiencing it for the first time. And then, you know, being where I am now. Um, I mean, without sounding too sappy, I mean, it's a dream come true. Yeah. Well, no one, no one told you you couldn't do it? <laughs> no, no, I guess not. Any chance of a System Shock crossover with any other Night Dive properties? Um, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but it has occurred to me that one of the things about systems that I love is that you can play little mini games in your in your uh, MFD, you know, like Wing, Wing Commander Zero and stuff. I've been I've been thinking I should uh, I should put Underworld Ascendant Zero in System Shock Three so you can play a little mini version of it. You so, thought about but, that too, huh? <laughs> I, yeah, I think that's the only crossover that's going to happen though. Someone, oh, I, I, someone I, I, suggested doing a crossover with System Shock and Epic Mickey, but that that just makes me cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, if either of us could ever talk about working with Disney again, like I, I'm sure we would have some interesting stories to, to well, share could, about that. There, there could there could be some interesting similarities in some ways between Epic Mickey and System Shock Three. You never know. He said mysteriously. <laughs> nice. Like the musical number. No, that will not be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I loved the musical number, by the way. That was, that was good. Uh, you know, it was, it was kind of a, a, a test run for what I wanted to do in Epic Mickey 3, which would have been spectacular, but didn't happen. Oh, well. people, people do not appreciate how 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 Disney Animation single-handedly kept the movie musical alive for decades. It's true. It's true. How did well, we no, get uh, off on this? I have no idea. <laughs> we had Shodan uh, use some kind of modular voice tool so that she sounded like Mickey, right? Like, oh, insects! <laughs> <laughs> you, now, why would you want to try to get me sued? That, that hardly seems true. <laughs> Although we could we could make her sound like NG Resonance for uh, Invisible War, I guess. Okay, nobody remembers <laughs> NG Resonance from Invisible War. That's a and deep I, cut. I will I will go cry in a corner. <laughs> now somewhere somewhere on the internet that's somebody's favorite thing because that's how they <laughs> the internet. Oh, man. You just need to find them. Yeah, that the one. You're the one. I think Daniel, you just went through a, a playthrough of Invisible War, didn't you? Uh, mm, not recently, no. Um, a few months ago, I did. Yeah. Did anybody yeah, actually yeah. play Invisible War? Yeah, I, I liked it, Invisible War except for the UI. Now, let's let's talk about system shift. Yeah. <laughs> Aww. And he never meant to hurt you, Warren. 
Well, and yes, Captain Raven, Invisible War wasn't so bad. That's true. I think it is a dramatically underrated game. Uh, and I could talk about that for days, but I, I won't because we're here to talk about something else. Some other time. I'll do a Reddit, uh, an Invisible War Reddit thing. Or something. <laughs> Uh, I'll go down my list of System Shock questions for people. Um, so regarding Shodan, uh, and this can be answered by uh, you guys in whatever order you like, um, what what are the what are the most interesting qualities you find about Shodan? And over the years since System Shock One has shipped, um, how how has Shodan entered into your lives, your thoughts, or even what fans have done? And what what has just clung to to your basically, I guess, just what's what's sort of stuck in all the years? Gosh, do should I? I don't know. Nightmares like, are an acceptable answer. Like, I mean, one thing is just like it's. I mean, it's a combination of the writing and and Terry's Terry's portrayal of her. But you know, this there's there's this there's this big risk with that with like that kind of character um, that you just get reduced to like, oh, I'm evil because I'm evil. Um, I hate, I hate puppies and music and fun. Um, and, but like Terry pulls it off as like such a, such a convincing megalomaniac, right? Like we're like, okay, so you, you're, you're always nattering on about how superior you are, but if you really felt so superior, you wouldn't always be nattering on about it, right? Like, what is it with you, Shodan? And like, I just really feel like, 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 she brings like this sort of really, really believable, like that that one defining quality of Shodan like needs that piece of nuance to not fall flat, um, and and it's I think it's I think it was just brilliantly done. And she was an intelligent villain, you know. She wasn't just some raving lunatic. There was there was some real intelligence there. Uh, you know, actually, not just to Shodan, but to the entire game. You could, you could. There was intelligence is the only word I can think of. That's that that's really inspirational. Uh, and you know, that's that comes down to writing and acting and believability uh, of the entire game. You know, she she was the essence of cyberpunk uh, at that time. Um, so intelligence is the word for me. That's that's what I've taken from her, and and what uh, I I hope my teams and I have been able to do in the games that have come since, and I hope we can do in System Shock Three. Yeah, and you know the, the funny thing. I don't know. He cut maybe out. Know, What's the funny uh, thing? Uh, Who maybe, maybe might know Terry from her portrayal of Victoria and Thief, right? Like. Like, unlike either of those characters, Terry is just like the sweetest person in the world. You would never guess it. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> she is just wonderful. Um, so, yeah. It's, it, it, it is acting, even if it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> uh, continuing on with uh, Shodan stuff, uh, what redeeming qualities, or in, in general, what would you find is relatable with Shodan? And wow, there's some feedback on somebody. Well, she's got an emotional side. She's not just cold and and um, you know uh, unemotional. She 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 actually responds to you in a way that you would expect a, a, uh, a an AI like her to uh, to react. You know. Yeah, I would I would also I'd add to that. You know, this this has a lot to do with uh, with Greg's sound design and and. You know, it's not just, I mean, part of it is like how we like are kind of like faking you out a little bit in the game, but the, the, the progression from early in the game when, when the, the, she comes across fairly normal as just like the voice of the computer on the station. And then like that glitchiness like starts and proceeds and, and just like snowballs. Uh, and you really get the sense of from that, or at least I do, right? Like at, at how this is like such a damaged character, right? And, and like that's really relatable and sympathetic to me, right? Like even if the result of it is kind of horrifying, right? Um, you know, it's like it, it, it's, this was all like put into motion not by her originally, right? Like like this was like this weird plot of Edward Diego's that like caused caused her to get like this bad code injected that just like irrevocably damaged her, uh, and I, I find that like you know. 
kind of, kind of, I don't know. It's, 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 it's very humanizing to me. Actually, you know, it's funny. I never thought about this until just this minute, but Shodan really does have a character arc too. You know, she doesn't, she's not just, um, the, the same, she's not the same at the end as she was at the beginning. It's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. I'll have to think about that a lot now. Wait a minute. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. I like it when we get you thinking. <clears throat> oh, you say that now. <laughs> I, I, I trust you. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> well, here come the feels again. <laughs> you just passed my head back there. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's me on the ground there. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah, I, I did heads for everyone. I had pretty long hair back then. <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> God, I'm really so bummed on. I can't see anything moving. The video has not progressed one frame since I started. Oh, uh, you're, you're missing out. Uh, do you have it paused, maybe? Or try refreshing the Twitch page? Uh, still no movement. It's in a different place now. Don't worry about it. That's that's the least <laughs> of our problems. So I know, that might be a the most of our problems. Sorry, the most of our problems. Um, do you guys have any stories about uh, what Shodan could have been or what it was like uh, coming up with her initial concept and, and what else she could have been and how you guys reached the decision to, I guess, make Shodan the character function and feel and act the way she is now. Woo. Wow. Yeah, I have no memory of that at all. Yeah, well, I think a lot of that was Austin and Doug, too. So it's, it's, it's a little hard for me to speak to that. Um, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned some of like the early, the early uh, ideas we were throwing around about, you know, just how, um, the, you know the idea of, of having of having like a sort of mastermind as a as a as a you know a, a, AI adversary in the game, um, and you know I think I think part of of what of how she, part of how Shodan ended up being who she was was those design compromises that we had to had to adopt um, to work around the limitations of of you know what was actually possible to, in terms of meeting that aspiration. You know, like I mentioned the. I mentioned before, like design practice, where like, you know, so much of System Shock is just designers playing cruel practical jokes on the player and then blaming them on Shodan, um, because better that you hate her than that you hate us for having just mess with you. Um, and I, you know, I think I think part of that is like there's there is that kind of like that um, kind of kind of trickster aspect to her personality came out of of uh, of of that practice and partly i think out of out of just my own my own and dorian's competition internally to like of like one up one upsmanship in the practical jokes right um which is a, a very dorian i claim that dorian drove me to that because it's more characteristic of him than me but um so yeah it was i think it was a, a combination of like i hadn't thought before very deeply about like how how the how the writing decisions and those and those uh, level design decisions um, uh, influenced each other in developing our character, but I, I definitely there's, think there's something there. Steven, do you have questions? I'm I'm watching uh, Daniel face off against these cyborgs. Really here. good at this game. <laughs> Can you tell us what you're doing? It's mesmerizing. <laughs> Uh, Daniel, describe this level and how you got to be so amazing at this game. Um, I just love the game so much. I, it, it has pretty much everything that I like in a um, in a game, which um, is surprising because I'm, I'm quite picky sometimes with what I really like for games, but this just seems to have it all. System Shock 2 even more so, but um, this one is just... It, it, I, every time I play it, I always find something new. I think I actually found while I'm playing this an audio log that I've never found before. So, it's. Um, hey, let me let me ask you a question. What was it about System Shock Two that was more so? I think the um, RPG I elements. Need to know. Honestly, I think the RPG elements and how you built 
how you uh, built your character. Some some of the uh, RP tree, RPG trees didn't really go anywhere, but some of them are r just really cool. And you, you had just the right amount of uh, cyber modules to um, really have to think about where you designate your um, what your skills. So that that was something that I uh, really liked in uh, System Shock 2. And the story, the the story is so it's just so it's, good. It's interesting because in System Shock One, the it was. It was a pretty conscious decision not to have that kind of RPG element. That it was, it was about the player in the world. You know, look at you, hacker, right? You don't have a name. You're defined yeah. by your skill as a player and by the the objects you find mm -hmm. and how you use them to solve problems. It's interesting that that's the thing you would single out because it's the, probably yeah. the biggest single change between the, the two games. And I am I am wrestling with that right now, and that is all I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I actually hadn't thought about, you know, there's, while on the one hand, a lot of people discount the role of um, of equipment in RPG progression, and obviously, like, System Shock, like, that's the whole RPG progression. Um, um, at the same time, like, there's there's a very, very different aesthetic that's achieved by that, right? Where, where you know, certainly until you, like, have the, you know, the walkthrough or whatever that is leading you to, like, seek out certain pieces of gear and you know, make these sort of customizing decisions on that basis. You know, it can lead to a gameplay experience that's that's uh, you know much less much less planned and and you know maybe less less maybe less expressive in some sense for that for that reason, but also maybe more improvisational. I'm not sure. Because I've never really thought of System Shot One as an RPG. Some people do call it an RPG, but I consider it more of kind of an adventure game. With shooting elements, it's sort of a high-level adventure game, in my opinion. It's it's, it's definitely like a, a a legit definitional problem. And and flummoxing marketing people is always a good thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't joking. No, I, I understand. <laughs> Uh, so my next set of questions are actually not exactly questions. It's more um, for other side people and, and Warren and everybody else. Do you guys have questions for people at Night Dive about stuff that we're doing or things that you're curious about or just stuff that you want us to keep in our radar that we can basically make a, a true remake or reboot to the, this original thing that you guys helped bring to life? Well, I, I am curious about how much you are planning to change beyond graphics, audio, and UI. I mean, it, the the game is what the game is. And, and like I said, when we started this, if you, if you just, if you did nothing more than that, you would you would have a state-of-the-art game that would blow people away. Are, are you planning bigger changes than that? Are you gonna introduce, you know, System Shock 2 RPG elements, for example, or anything like that? Well, I know you have, you have that uh, stretch goal that looks like it might be pretty attainable at this point, where where there'd be some some additional story content added, you know, which which might I don't know. Like there's that that leaves you with the interesting problem of like of really grokking like what is it that makes a system track level a system track level, right? Um, and I'd I'd love to talk with you guys at some point about that, assuming that you end up with that problem to solve. Yeah, it's 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 going to be like this really fine line that we're we're going to balance between, you know, obviously maintaining this original vision as, as faithfully as, as possible. And um, while adding something a little unique, like a, a touch from our own kind of, you know, from our own resources. And um, to, to answer your question in terms of like the story elements, um, what I had kind of envisioned was just seeing this as an opportunity to maybe explore um, some of the crew members a little bit more a little more intimately like in for instance in system shock 2 you know you find a lot of um a logs of people discussing their kind of personal issues their you know their mundane day-to-day -day activities um and kind of exploring that element a bit more just to provide maybe even more depth to um to citadel station and this the people that lived on there and um you know maybe bring more of a human element um, into what happened and make it making making it even more tragic yeah um, sure um, so that's one of the things that I was kind of looking forward to it wouldn't be like 
changing the narrative or you know the pacing of the story really it would just be hey we have this opportunity to to get more into the guts of of you know what happened um and exploring that a bit more um and in terms of the rpg elements i think uh jason you know feel free to to hop in on this um but it wouldn't be yeah, it wouldn't be so much introducing like or trying to introduce things from Shock Two and Shock One, uh, which we kind of done with the uh, the interface. Um, it would be kind of enabling the player a more organic approach towards building a character, where it's not stat driven specifically. It's um, here are some tools, uh, here are some mechanics. Um, take what you like um, that you're most comfortable with and you know, you'll know you be able to um, find a play style that you're comfortable with. And uh, by doing that, you know we hope that um, every player is going to have a very unique experience of how they approach uh, certain uh, problems in the game. Um, I mean, if I could equate it to anything, it would be, you know, maybe like what, uh, you know, Harvey Smith and his team at Arcane did with uh, Dishonored, where you know, they've given the player um, a lot of these abilities and these skills. And depending on who you are, you approach, you know, a scenario or an objective differently based on which, you know, which, which better suits your personal play style. Yeah, hey, I, my motto has been play style matters for about a decade and a half. You know, so every player having a unique experience based on their personal preferences is uh, a pretty nice thing to do in a game. You might see some of that in System Shock 3, too. Oh, yeah. I love that. Oh wow! I just, I just, I don't, I, I totally forgot, and I just realized as you're running around with the laser rapier. Uh, yeah. I, 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 okay, I'm just gonna go back to like an old, an old story now. Uh, so forgive me, but um, if that you, I do if it. Notice, That's what we're here for. If you notice when, like, when you go to the weapons, like each of them has this, this like little serial number that's always like, it's like two letters, and then so like the TSO4 laser rapier. TS is Tim Stelmach and the TSO4 laser rapier. Like all those, all, all those serial numbers are like for, for different members of the team. Like the the pistol, the ML, whatever is for Mark LeBlanc, and yeah. So something else you didn't tell the producer. The dark gun is Sarah Varelli, I think SV. So the spark beam doesn't have a. Oh, and I think the mag pulse must be Sean Barrett. Yeah. <laughs> You learn something new every day, 22 you, years you later. You never told me that? <laughs> you never <laughs> told me that. Your name's the game. <laughs> nope. Nope. Never, never told me. Well, now you know. There you go. <laughs> wow, I, I, I'd forgotten that, and now I'm glad that like I, I ended up with the most awesome weapon in the game. Are there any other Easter eggs like that that um, we you know, may not know about? Well, Rob mentioned the, mentioned the severed heads, right? We're like, those are all. So whose head is that? Different oh, team I don't, I don't know if Dan's going to be able to. There's a slight delay, but there's a severed head in that room he was just in. It. Yeah, um, it was. That was one of the play testers. OK, all right. I can't remember. I can't believe name. you remember that after all these years. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I just, I just, I, I had to take his word for it. Oh man, look at it in the inventory. That's pretty <laughs> gruesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, Stephen, is this something that we're going to be carrying over from the first game, putting all of our heads decapitated and disgusting in there? <laughs> I think it's got to be done. Yeah, if you, I'll be disappointed if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to be a severed head. The um, Tim, you know, you're talking about the uh, the positioning um, little icon up there and the HUD. Yeah. Um, that's one little Easter egg that I wanted to. Oh, there's Doug Church. <laughs> that's Doug Church's head. Uh, yeah, when he had hair. Or no, that's um. <laughs> oh no, that looks like that was <laughs> cruel. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Man. Anyway, that that uh that icon I up there, um, as far as your crouching and leaning positions and whatnot, I 
sort of remade that graphic to put on one of the uh, screen displays. So it's just sort of like a little Easter egg that some people will recognize mm. as a way to keep that. You know, I, I, I probably shouldn't tell this story, but um, there was around the same time I was, I was working with the Looking Glass guys on System Shock, I was working with another developer on a game called Cyber Mage. And the, they were both sort of futuristic first person games. And um, let's just say I liked System Shock. Uh, but I, I, I took them both to a, a trade show. And I, I remember watching um, like grown, grown adult gamers playing System Shock and getting themselves stuck in a corner, crouched, leaning, with no way to get out of the corner. Because <laughs> it was, the UI was, was a little inelegant. And then oh, I turned around, sad. I turned around and I watched, uh, I, it couldn't have been more than eight years old, an eight year old kid reaching up for the joystick to play Cyber Mage, which just, I mean, all, all due respect to the people who made that game, but it wasn't happening. And just running around, having a good time, shooting stuff and everything, and I just about. You wept openly, admit it. I, I did, I did. <laughs> it was, it was, no, come over here and play this one. Uh, Cyber Mage. I for, yeah, I hadn't thought about Cyber Mage in a long time. The, the the game where you wear uh, a uh, the the dishwashing glove in your hand. Just just look it up. <laughs> All right, I don't remember anything about that. <laughs> the, your your hand looked like you were wearing a dishwashing glove. Mm. That's all we're gonna say about Cyberpunk. I've already probably lost a friend of. <laughs> Oh, it's, I see a, a comment in the chat. I find the maintenance a little horrifying to go through. Yeah, well, that's that's one of Dorian's levels, I think, if I remember correctly. So he was a right rat bastard about a lot of this stuff. Damn those respawning blocks. Yeah, the the respawn can be kind of deadly in, in uh, System Shock. That's for sure. It's also so predictive. It, it, if I remember correctly, it, it was it was all driven by how many things you killed. So you could actually like count down how many things you had killed to avoid respawning stuff. Wow, was I didn't it, remember that. Yeah, yeah, you could you could actually say, okay, if I, as long as I don't kill one more, you know, repair bot, the repair bots won't respawn. Right. Now I have this clear mental picture of like getting yourself in trouble with the one guy you know you must not kill. Yep. yep. <laughs> there was when I played, there was a lot of avoidance uh, going on. Wow. Well, you know, I got to tell you, my laptop is about to run out of power. So if anybody has any questions, <laughs> ask them. Please. Yeah. How how long have we been? We've been going a while. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, according to the schedule, uh, the you guys are welcome to drop out whenever you want or stick around. We're we're going to be closing the stream at uh, 4 p.m. Pacific, so in 40 minutes. Um, but I mean, uh, you guys were only slotted in for an hour, an hour and a half, and the the amount of time you guys have put in already has been incredibly awesome. Actually, so, Paul, I mean, did by all means, if you need to go. So, just so you know that. Well, I I probably have 10 more minutes of uh, of battery power. So I'm going to drop off whether I like it or not at some point very soon. Now, if there are more questions, I mean, I'll stick around until literally I run out of power. But uh, if not, I'm going to I'm going to say good night. Um, all the questions I have are kind of lengthy ones, so I'd much rather just turn the floor over to you and just have you talk about whatever you feel like talking about. Tell us stories. Uh, well, okay. So one other thing I love about Shock uh, is that. The, one of the one of the toughest problems in in uh, gaming, uh, other than third person camera, and that's all we're going to talk about. That um, is player direction, and and 
some system shock games actually but especially system shock one it's like the levels were color coded right i mean the if, if you if you were on the the medical deck it was like mostly blue if i remember and you know the there there was there was the the executive level was mostly gold so you always kind of knew where you were based on the color coding of the level which i thought was really clever yeah, yeah there was it, I, it I remember also the... It also could have been a bit of a happy mistake. I mean, there is definitely some thought into it, but I always look at look back at these texture sets and just cringe because I mean, it was, you know, we as as the art team, I just remember pretty much doing whatever the hell we wanted to do as far as you know producing the textures and whatnot, and there just was like I don't even think we amongst each other like critiqued each other's stuff is yeah you know, well maybe a little bit but it's just like oh you just did a red texture okay great you know and uh, i guess we'll try to fit that in with the blue and you know and then it wasn't even the artists that implemented them it was you know the designers just like you know kind of painted the spaces with them so yeah i remember that as being all, yeah a lot of that was on was on us like just like sort of like to put together a look for like the the, the the art direction was yeah it was all at the at the sort of like the the raw materials level right like here's the texture set yeah um, yeah and the doors um, stood out I mean it, I I don't know I I still I still find it surprisingly appealing I guess the look yeah. of the game it's very well, odd this kind of gets back too to like what I was saying before about like how 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 little we knew comparatively at the time about like what what the procedure should be for, for, for doing one of these projects, right? Um, so yeah, in terms of, in terms of, of art direction, that's just one example of like things that, uh, you know, everyone was kind of making it up as they went along to some extent about like how we should even go about it. Um, it was a very different time. Yeah. And just, just look at all of those, uh, uh, all of those, those, uh, characters, the enemies. I just when I when I that's the thing I look back on and go, oh my gosh, we we should have done better, you know. I, in both System Shock One and System Shock Two, the the characters could have used some work. Not okay. in terms of their design, in terms of in terms of what we were able to do with them at the time. Yeah, I yeah you know, I I understood that. So I think you hurt Rob's feelings because he's. Yeah, that's that's why I wanted to qualify it. It was, not, <laughs> it was not the designs that were the problem. It was our ability to execute against the designs that was. No, the I problem. would. Yeah, I would. Uh, to, to be to be serious though, like I would still I would still hold up these a lot of these concepts against you know the the best ones that I that I've ever seen. Like, Absolutely. It, yeah, I it, still. Uh, I still think there's you know there's. At the time, again, it was just like whatever the heck we wanted to come up with, um, and you know whatever personal inspirations we were drawing from. Um, Some of your know, your concept art is is framed and was on my wall for years and is now uh, in a museum. Really? Yeah. What yeah, museum? In Austin, in Austin, Texas, the Center for American History has uh, has some of your concept art. Oh wow! Well, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Um. Yeah. So, you know, and so how we, you know, we built these things and then just had to, uh, you know, render render them off as sprites and whatnot, and you know, and then here and there did a little bit of touch up on them and in pixel paint and whatnot, but um, but yeah, I. I, I actually remember a time where there was a debate on if we should alias them or not. And some of the, remember a bunch of the robots were done without aliasing and they just looked, in my mind, they just looked terrible, you know, like, cause they were just so chunky, so pixelated and, you know, um, without that sort of uh, aliasing to black, you know, to at least sort of define them. Um, you were really, you know, it was a really a stretch to call anything, you know, uh, a character, you know, like you could, you just couldn't really decipher it. Um, so 
I think, and there were, you know, again, it was just like, I remember Mike at the time was, was doing the robots without the, uh, without the aliasing. And then at some point, I think he got switched on to a different project, maybe flight. And I, <laughs> I, and I, I took it upon myself to basically re-render all the characters with aliasing. Oh man. Wow. I have this irrational fondness for these for these gorilla tigers, by the way. That's that's the piece of concept art that I got framed and hung on my wall for many years and is now at the Center for American History, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. We got an updated concept of the gorilla tiger that you guys are going to love. It came out really good. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to playing, that's for sure. Warren's probably almost out of juice. Um, any final thoughts, Warren? Uh, I'm I'm pretty pretty thought out. Just uh, <laughs> don't don't do too much, so I have something new to do in System Three. That's all I have. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna bail here. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, other folks from the other side, feel free to stick around. We still have 30 minutes left, or if you guys need to head out, that's understandable. Um, but everybody in the Twitch channel, please thank Warren Spector for his time and being so kind to uh, to hang out with all of us today. It's very much appreciated. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Warren. Later, Warren. All right, take it easy, guys. Bye now. Thanks, Warren. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to take this opportunity to to, to bow out as well. Um, but this is this has been great. And okay. Sure... Uh, oh, and I guess we lost Paul earlier, and he, he didn't. Yeah, he has, he had to step out a little bit before Warren did. So. Okay, uh, well, everybody also, uh, please thank Paul and Tim for their time. And uh, again, uh, same spiel I said for Warren. Like, it's it's been awesome for, for you guys to sit in and just share all these great stories with us. We really appreciate it. And Twitch guys, please please give them your thanks as well, because it is awesome. Yes, thank you very much for to, coming on. Uh, with you guys closing out the Kickstarter campaign. Thank you, so thank you very much. Really So, um, I think since uh, we started the stream, we've raised almost another, let's say, fifteen thousand. Added to our, nice. Added to our uh, campaign. So hmm. Like, what should we talk about thing. now? I think we've also gone ahead and have we? I think we hit the thousand viewer achievement as well. Yep. Uh, so we, we got more achievements. I don't know if that unlocks a reward or not as well for them. Sweet. Um, let's see. So at this point in the video, uh, the, the other side guys have, have lent their commentary uh, awesomely. We have 30 minutes remaining. So uh, folks from Night Dive, it's now completely open. Uh, there's no more rules. Talk about whatever you want. Uh, Steven is the king. So wait, now that sounded weird. Um, he, <laughs> he's, he's the head cheese. Uh, so what he says goes, so please give him the floor when you can. Um, I was going to say we could open it up to, uh, to Twitch and, and take some questions. Ooh, yes, yes, we can. But we're going to get a lot of questions, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to get to everything. Uh, in the key of Alex XV, will there be a closed alpha? Should I answer logistic questions like that? Uh, should we? <laughs> uh, we don't have most to, games that are single player uh, typically don't do a closed alpha. It's just far, far too early. Um, closed beta for sure. Um, but even then, uh, that will also be limited because um, most of the feedback we would get uh, would be uh, just by volume, just an in incredible amount. Um, alpha probably is less likely. I mean, we might have a small internal build floating around, um, but probably not something that's backer facing. Plus, you wouldn't really want to play a early alpha. I mean, it's it, it's so far from the final product, and it would spoil so many of the cool things that we're doing. Uh, we'd much rather you guys play the game when it's it's when it looks better than an alpha. Boy, let's see what else we got. Jason, do you want to talk more about the the classic mode? We 
No. Um, let's see. So, uh, I mean, uh, there was a, a post I put up uh, in a Kickstarter update that, that clarified some stuff in, in the directions we're going, and not necessarily uh, with with concrete uh, anything concrete in one direction or another, just because it's it's too early to really. I, I guess commit to any particular thing, and I think it's better just to talk about what we're looking at uh, and, and keeping on the radar to sort of be our moral compass. And um, I mean, I, most people have heard me say this before, but it, it's something that we always go back to: is just looking at Looking Glass Studios and what what they did back in the day compared to what other games were doing back then, and trying to almost emulate and carry on that tradition of innovation and just bringing new things to the industry where it makes sense to and not being afraid to, to take risks. And we're not going to deviate really from, from the formula that System Shock 1 provided. Um, the goal is to make a game that is appealing to fans old and new. And how we execute on that and all the details, I mean, that's that's going to be coming in the in se- next few months and several months ahead. But right now, I mean, we just finished our Kickstarter and it's just too early to talk about a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I'll stop picking questions like that. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Is it too early to ask the question about the cyborg speedos that I saw in chat? Uh, no, it's too late to ask questions like that. The cyborg elites, yeah, the metal speedos. <laughs> That'll be for tomorrow's midnight stream, night dive after dark. Uh, actually, we're going to have a backer reward that we're going to announce then where there will be metal Speedos for everyone. <laughs> that does not sound comfortable. That's one of those things with the Elite Cyborg. That, you know, again, because there was, there just really wasn't uh, much resistance as far as whatever we, you know, wanted to do. And for whatever reason, I, you know, designed him like I did. I was thinking like, you know, sort of taken inspiration a little bit from like heavy metal magazine, I suppose. But um, yeah, in, you know, looking back at that design, I, I just can't believe, you know, people like let that ship and didn't tell me to put some pants on the guy. <laughs> okay, so I have I have an interesting question for Rob then. Once once we, we have, have like a high detail model of that in the game and people are playing it, how would you feel if you start seeing pictures of people cosplaying as that? <laughs> I've actually thought about that. I'm like, <laughs> that thing, if that thing comes back to haunt me at, you know, Oh, it will. Yeah. Like in the flesh, that would be quite scary. In a lot of flesh. <laughs> yeah. The, and it would probably be a different type of fear than if it was the actual physical thing in front of you that you, you wouldn't be fearing for your life. You probably have a different type of fear about you. Yeah. More questions. We're like seeing yeah. some zoom by, so if we don't get to your question, feel free to repeat it. Yeah. Uh, Flame US 3R. The difference between the remix soundtrack achievement and the stretch goal is that the achievement, the stretch goal is to have the album as a separate element. Uh, that's to essentially cover the cost of getting these world-class musicians on board with us, getting them to, to work with us, and all the management of all that, and the recording costs, and everything like that. <coughs> um, the achievement is on our end to code that into the game as maybe an alternative mode, uh, maybe an unlockable. We haven't quite decided how it's going to be uh, implemented, but that's the difference, is that one is to, to get it recorded and made and to fund the actual album, and the other is to get it put in the in the engine itself so that you can listen to it interactively as you play <coughs> Ooh, I, I really really want to answer killjoy 98's question uh he's asking or, or she uh what is your favorite part of system shock and uh i, I just have a, a quick but interesting answer for this um for me system shock has always been about shodan and just ai's uh i i'm a huge sci-fi nerd i, I love the concept of ai i majored in computer science with a specialty in AI, I, I love artificial intelligence. And Shodan is a fascinating character to me. And I'd like to find more ways of exploring just what are what are her motivations? How, where did things go wrong? Like with, with how you code an AI to, and then, I mean, typically there should be like some, some locks in there so that they don't go crazy. And, and what happened, what went wrong? And like looking at Edward Diego's role in it. And that's, that's something that really, really interests me. And 
I'm hoping that we get to explore more of just what makes Shodan tick and, and just maybe even see just more ways of, of shining her character through in the story. Um, and that's that's exciting to me. But I think everybody should answer that question that's that's on the team in the channel. Uh, Steven, what's what, what, what do you what's your favorite part of System Shock? Well, this is interesting because um, in the key of uh, Alex V, how would you compare System Shock Shodan to Ex Machina's Eva? Yes. Yeah. Did you see that movie? Yeah. I, yeah. Everybody see that movie? Yeah. There was. I had a picture of that in the. Never mind. That, that's um, an internal thing. Yeah. Um, man, uh, that's a really good question. I mean, Eva herself is, you know, she. It's almost like the reverse role of of System Shock, where she's the cap. You know, she's being held captive and she's in isolation, and and the only systems that she has to explore are the ones that are internal to her. Um, that is until well, I probably shouldn't discuss the plot of the movie or anything like that. But um, you know, her goal is to is to spread out, and and Shodan is very much um, in the same way uh, with her body being Citadel Station and her goal of uh, being transmitted to Earth in order to to spread and multiply and you know see her um, <clears throat> her mission kind of come to fruition. Um, so like yeah, I mean my favorite thing about System Shock had to be. Um, definitely Shodan. Um, she's really provides like the driving force and the motivation behind pretty much everything in the game. And, and because she's this like eternal thing um, that's omniscient and kind of omnipresent, um, she just she just makes for such a, a great character to um, to I guess battle uh, and to. Um, just deal with in general because of her, you know, her philosophical um, stance on humanity and, you know, the, you know, the flesh of human beings being this kind of weakness. And I don't know, it's just been, it's just, it's, she's been really cool and really fascinating for a long time. Cause, um, you know, I grew up like you, Jason, like watching Star Trek and um, a lot of science fiction and, and the Borg were something that I, uh, oh yeah was particularly fond of as well and they're kind of you know in a very similar vein they're about um you know finding perfection in in uh conformity and um well, you know oh man we're gonna have a big discussion about this now yeah okay well dave if you want to carry it on i mean i mean i mean it is kind of in the vein of ai's but to me the borg was more about evolution uh where i mean their their whole goal was almost an organic uh, life form as a singular entity and so every everything that they did was all to further their own uh, twisted yet robotic evolution and I mean t to me I think that's that's kind of what what even Shodan boils down to is survival um, and anytime if that survival is threatened uh, she will fight tooth and nail to preserve herself uh, because I mean what life form that should like survive evolution not have a survival instinct within them and I think that's that's really like the, the core of it is those, those baser instincts, and and that kind of is is what we can explore to see like what truly makes Shodan tick. How about you, Daniel? I'd like to hear your. Uh, by it. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question? Sorry, I was busy concentrating. What's on your blank. favorite part about System Shock? Hmm. Daniel's like I'm I'm living it right now. I'm living it all. <laughs> I guess the isolation. And the loneliness of it, um, you know, you're, oh, you're Daniel, I feel so sad for you. <laughs> you're you're sort of trapped, million Which miles away. Give Daniel a hug. <laughs> the, you know, there's there's no help coming. You know, it's it's all doomed. There is something that is actively a threat, and you're the only one who's gonna deal with it. Because somebody did send somebody to try and investigate what was going what was going on, and uh, they got shot down. On the way on the way to the station, so it was very clear that there's just no hope coming. It's the same with Shock Two. You're you're so far away from any help, and just the sense of being trapped in this place you can't escape from is just something that I really find um, quite appealing about the series. <laughs> Probably not the most uplifting thing about it, but uh, that's what that's what kind of does it for me. All right. Well, 
We're gonna have a longer chat later just to see if you're doing okay. <laughs> send, a, send a formal letter to HR. <laughs> uh, John, what about you? I'm gonna go with, uh, I mean, you guys already said Shodan, and she's obviously a huge part of the series and the story, but I'm gonna go with the environments. Um, not even necessarily uh, the layouts of them or the shapes of them, but more how the environments are so much a character in the game that Citadel Station and, and the Von Braun are both just such believable, moody, emotional places without uh, without having any dialogue, without having any, any, any breath, without having any blood. Uh, they still are as much a part of the story and, and as... I would say even potentially more a part of the story than Shodan. Um, just learning all about it as you're going through. I, I love that. I love environments and environmental storytelling and atmosphere. Because oh, the, the places of shock, especially System Shock 2, it always feels as if it's a place that um, is it lived in. It's not. It's not always horrible all the time it actually feel you know there's recreation areas there's areas where people played games and things like that so uh, the fact that they feel more like places that people would actually live is also something that um, I find quite good about the series mm -hmm. well Rob definitely has his biases but I guess we can ask the same question to Rob huh <laughs> well I kind of, I've kind of uh, side with with sort of your your take. Like for me, the um, you know, even though I dissed, you know, some of the color schemes and and all that. The, uh, for me, looking back at it and just looking at it now, I, I just like the just the encapsulated, you know, aesthetic, you know, and period of it. Um, you know, like. You know, being being you know the color schemes and you know and granted you know like I think there's going forward you know I think there's a lot that can be done to sort of make make these spaces less less harsh and more believable and less you know obviously wallpapered and whatnot but the um, but the general you know aesthetic and and just sort of that. Um, you know, and, and having the, the sort of diverse population of characters and, and all. Yeah, it's for me, it really is just the, you know, just the environment itself of, of the Citadel Station and just sort of, uh, just sort of embracing, you know, it's, it's sort of aesthetic and, and crudeness, you know, in a, in a loving way. To me, art style-wise, there's not any sort of, like... It doesn't look like many other things to me, uh, science fiction-wise. Now, I'm... You know, I, maybe Jason will correct me, because his science fiction repertoire is uh, at Godly That's right, amounts. John. Just let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> well, I mean, you already got into the Borg argument. <laughs> well... Um, no, no, but it, it doesn't look like any sort of standard science fiction world that, I, that I've seen. It doesn't look like, you know, so many Star Trek knockoffs or so many alien knockoffs or so many Star Wars knockoffs. It, it's, it's got its own unique style that you guys mm. have sort of carved out. Well, yeah, he's about to correct mm. me. Uh, you know, you know. Hi, John. Uh, hi, hi, John. <laughs> hey, Corey. Uh, this is Corey, everyone. He works with uh, Arms and Anchors, who did our, uh, our branding and our design for the, uh, uh, as in a brand design for the for the game he did our Kickstarter. Well, you, you uh, got you got a fizzy this time, John. Uh, I'll school you later. Saved by the the Corey. Yep. I just I just got you out of that one. <laughs> or did you? Oh, it's silence. Okay. So so I saw a um, question about the uh, uh, <laughs> the remix soundtrack. They're asking if. Uh, if we didn't make the remix goal, if we would still do it, I don't. I, that, that's something we're gonna have to talk about later. It's something that obviously we all want to do. I mean, we all have have loved talking with uh, 
with the artists and having having their support and these, the artists <laughs> seem so stoked about it i mean if you follow any of these guys on social media they all uh are incredibly excited to be a part of the project um it just has to make sense if it's something that we can uh essentially afford to do time wise resource wise uh personnel wise money wise I think the better answer is none of us really want to do it, especially John. He really doesn't want to do it. So <laughs> thanks, Corey. If we, if we don't meet it, then you know he's gonna be really happy. <laughs> Awkward silence. Well, we're looking up some more uh, some more questions here. Oh, good. Well, we're waiting. I'll talk date... about sci-fi stuff with John. Would you uh, date Shodan if she promised you a seat at the throne? I would date Shodan even without that promise. You know, I just love a strong, commanding uh, partner in a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> one that, can, one that with... can fix the router when the internet goes down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> relationship, though, because you'll always be talking to her through your computer. <laughs> well, what if I have to go out and go see nature? I just need a, I just need a break. I need, and instead of going in the other room, I go take a walk in the mountains. Except for you'll be on a space station because she's not going to let you go anywhere. <laughs> Dating Shodan ending confirmed. I think we already brought up the whole romance side quest earlier in the stream, yeah? Um, even the Borg Queen attempted to, uh, well, she found Data as like the perfect mate, but she tried to lure Picard uh, into being her... Um, God, how would you even put it? Her other half, her her free her free will thinking half. Her man slave. <laughs> oh, died. This is one I keep seeing. Has anyone heard of um? Was it Arx Fatalis? We keep getting that one. Yeah, it was um, uh, uh, I think uh, Arcane's first game. Mm -hmm. Arcane Studio before they um, did uh, Dishonored, and I'd I'd heard about it. Uh, you can get it on GOG and Steam for like four ninety nine or five ninety nine, and uh, apparently it's a really great game. But um, I personally haven't played it. Do you know if it's the same guys uh, who did Dishonored? I mean, I know there's a yeah. lot of Looking Glass blood in it. Yep, yeah, it's, it's the uh, same Arcane. people. Not going that way again. <laughs> they just keep talking about the Shodan relationship. It would be an imbalanced, horrible <laughs> relationship. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what's taken over at this point. Shodan dating. Yep, I like it. Are you gonna play with people's expectations in the remake, like Shodan tricking you in a different place than the original? Well, I don't know if it would be a system shock game if we just played everyone's expectations, right? Like, if it was like story-wise, when it comes, if everyone's expecting every twist, then what's the twist? Is what I mean. Yeah, well, I think I think you know I've heard this a lot actually. People are like, well, are you gonna have? Are you gonna change it so that there's something like um, in System Shock Two when discovering Polito is. Um you know actually Shodan or are you gonna do something similar to like what Bioshock did with uh, with Atlas mm -hmm. um, I mean it would be probably expected at this point right I mean wouldn't be very much of a surprise well I think the other thing to keep in mind is we're we're not gonna deviate too far from the rails as to what the the story and narrative was and we'll probably fix and address things and make a few modifications, but I think the overall core of it will still be true to System Shock 1. I like this. Be playing System Shock is like being in a bad relationship with Shodan anyway. SS1 versus Remake, what are you aiming to be most innovatively different? Uh, hardware accelerated graphics. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's one. Um, are we open to Easter eggs? 
And if so, do we have any planned? Yes. I have not been on a single game project where there has not been Easter eggs. It is, yes. yes. I, I have Easter eggs lined up for this game. Um, I'm not going to tell anybody any of them. I think that's um, the point of an Easter egg. You gotta find them, yeah. <laughs> Although there yeah. will be there will be one um, plushie somewhere in the game. You'll just have to find it. <laughs> a plushie? Yeah, just one. What, what, are, you talking about? what are you talking about? A plush, maybe. Somewhere. Oh yeah. Tiger girl plush. It's funny. I think uh, on Fallout, I mean, we had a, a mode which would like be basically easter egg mode and there were things that were easter eggs that were never intended to be easter eggs but uh, i guess they were technically because they were just bugs and stuff that we had left in on accident that had like some weird semblance or meaning but stuff we did not want to ship in the final product and we just called them easter eggs to be safe <laughs> um you can play the game in broken mode uh any plans on making the remake uh co-op capable ramping up the enemies by the number of players it's another one where... Um... I'll take that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, that would that would require uh, a much larger budget. Uh, we are open to it, but at this point, there are no solid plans. Yeah, there's still like uh, what, a little less than 48 hours. If anybody wants to go ahead and dump a million dollars in there. Yeah, I mean, the, the more we raise, the, the, the higher the chances of that happening. But it's, it's not trivial to just add co-op. I mean, it... It really does play a lot into the design of a level, uh, the scalability of, of encounters, and it's it's a lot of work. Uh, and and we know that. I mean, I've I've worked on some games that have some co-op elements, and it's it's just it's it's not something to be taken lightly. And right now, I mean, with with our current budget, we want to focus on pouring as much of that budget as possible into making an amazing single-player experience. And then, if if we have more money than we know what to do with, then we'll think about co-op. That's a pretty good problem to have. Isn't it? <laughs> I'll take it. Hi, Bubba. Yeah, I mean, it, this isn't written on the Kickstarter page, but it, there is actually a $1 million stretch goal or reward tier where I will personally fly to your house and I will eat all your food, hang out with you for a week. A whole week? I'm just going to send you there anyways, John. <laughs> Um, someone was saying, "Who suggested filter?" That was me. Actually, one of my one of my fondest memories of playing System Shock Two was um, this one night where I think like my parents had gone out and I was all alone and you know, typical teenage boy plays video games, does nothing else. Sure. And, yeah. <laughs> and I was listening to Filter while I was playing and um that one song came on called uh cancer and there's like this really just creepy female voice um in that song and she you know i could be uh misconstruing the meaning of the song now but i believe you know back then it was about how uh humans are like a cancer that have spread across the earth and have destroyed everything that's good and it kind of fit with the tone of the game like pretty perfectly and it was just weird it's just something that's always stuck with me since then and um i feel like it's got this kind of cool heavy industrial beat too that's very um you know cyberpunk kind of sounding mm -hmm. yeah i remember you sent me that song uh, a couple a month or so ago I remember this the song that's playing in the background now is very uh, nine inch nails um yes sounding. Sorry, I really like Nine Inch Nails. It's it's pretty directly Nine Inch Nails too. There's a yeah. head for a hole. It's pretty much like <laughs> almost. What, wait, wait, level. did you just say head for a hole? Or, oh, John. Uh... <laughs> John, you know, I just remembered that I met. Um, I went to a reunion show, or like, you know, um, a show for a band called Failure. Yeah. Um, a couple oh, of months ago. Fun. And um, one of the guys that was with them, um, like I did like the VIP package where you get to go and like meet the band and stuff. And one of the guys that was like helping produce the show was um, a guy that worked with Trent Reznor and, um, you know, did a lot of the Nine Inch Nails stuff. And you know, I told him about kind of what we were doing. 
mm -hmm. how some of the music was inspired, you know, inspired uh, by Nine Inch Nails. And he gave me his card. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Do you know yeah, what I, he did with Nine Inch Nails in particular? Like um, you said, he worked with them. I think he was like a producer. Oh, okay. Um, so I totally forgot about that, but maybe we could actually get... I mean, Trent Reznor did this stuff for Quake. Um, hell, who knows? We could, we could uh, reach out and see what he says. Oh, that'd be awesome. I get to play with his... Uh, I can come and play with his giant, giant, giant modular rack. <laughs> He's got oh, every yeah. play imaginable. We actually almost uh, got, somehow got uh, Nine Inch Nails to help with some New Vegas stuff, um, but it fell through uh, because uh, Trent Reznor's cousin was one of our level designers on New Vegas, and uh, so that was a pretty strong contact, but it didn't happen. But it really would have been cool. What happened? How, why couldn't... Uh... Scheduling conflicts, timing, um, stuff that I shouldn't talk about with publishers. Well, that's, I guess another contact, right? That we could possibly reach out to. Yeah, maybe. Not promising anything. Oh, this that tile set right there. This is another music thing that's always kind of bugged me about this game. I mean, it hasn't really bugged me, but um, Daniel, you know the the tile where it's like a white square in the middle, and then there's um, like circuitry kind of going out from it. Yeah. Um. That to me, whenever I saw that, it, it looked exactly like the album cover for Tools Anima. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, I see it. And I was, I always wondered if uh, if Rob was a fan of Tool and was just like, I don't know, couldn't figure out what to do for that tile. It's like, yeah, hey, this album cover would, would look good. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He used to have a long, really, really long hair. He said so. It wouldn't post. I wouldn't put it past him to have been a metalhead. Is he still here? Uh, yeah, no, he, he dipped out. I don't know what happened. Okay. I don't know. He's yeah. here. He's, he's muted. He's muted. He's here. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'd be interested. I'll have to ask him that. All right. Well, we're coming up at uh, clock here. Is there any other last thoughts or any, any last burning questions that... Uh, Anyone wants to answer, get out of the way. Just thanks for showing up to the stream, everybody. Steve, That's really all I have to say. You, how old were you when you first played the first System Shock again? Seven. The very, the very first System Shock. Yep. Oh man, I don't know exactly. It was like somewhere between seven and nine, I think. Well, didn't it show him in the uh, Kickstarter video as nine? That was him. Yeah, yeah, that was really me in real time, so. <laughs> <laughs> what are you planning on changing the most? The resolution. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess. You like you my know, answers? I love my answers. Metrically speaking. The HUD. Yeah, I mean, the most, like the most, I mean, just overall, just the visuals. Platform compatibility. Yeah, just at, well, everything I guess if we're gonna go that far. Um, the storyline. No, what? Story no, what? Story no. Showing him with a pony. What? Okay, now this is misinformation. <laughs> now you, now they can't trust anything we say. Good. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you everybody for coming and spending all this time with us. Uh, Thanks again to our wonderful guests at Other Side. Um, that was a real treat, and I'm, I hope that everybody enjoyed, um, you know, hearing the stories of the development and and what they're currently up to. And and um, yeah, I mean, it's it's such a great thing that they're they're on our side, and uh, you know, they're going to be helping us uh, maintain just the the legacy that that System Shock has has created over the last, you know, almost twenty. 22 23 years um so yeah thanks again for joining us uh stream tomorrow before oh, yeah. you guys hop off of here uh tomorrow at noon pacific time uh until noon the next day we're having a 24 we're not, hour we're not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not announcing the full schedule yet that's coming in an update <laughs> we can say when it starts oh but we're not saying what it is yet well we already we already announced that it was a 24 hour one in the update but we didn't announce the content 
Oh, okay. Well, it's a 24-hour stream, wall to wall. Uh, last 24 hours. There's cool stuff in it. Uh, whatever that stuff may be. Stay tuned for a Kickstarter update coming tonight, which will detail the schedule. Uh, but yes, it is going to have uh, some very interesting special guests and uh, interesting games that we'll be showing. I think I should just like wear the title of Captain Non-Answer. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, check in back for that or follow us on Twitter if you haven't already. We'll be announcing it when it's happening and I'm sure giving real-time updates of what's coming on as it's as it's happening. So just stay tuned with us and you'll learn more about that. Uh, in two hours, I'm having a sound design stream on this channel uh, where I get to make, show off making sound effects and, uh, and musical sounds for System Shock. Um, Speaking of which, I gotta hop off here and figure out the audio side of getting Ozio drivers to work with this. Ozio. Yeah, and, and uh, finally, I mean, thanks, thank you very much to Daniel for uh, playing through System Shock, uh, the de the pre-alpha demo, and then the original game this entire time. I mean, for three hours without getting up for a bio break. <laughs> <laughs> it's System Shock. I can find the time for it. Yeah, and Man. thanks to everybody on the in the chat. I mean. We saw a, a massive bump in our in our Kickstarter during the during the stream, and um, yeah, thank you so much for your support. Thanks, everybody. Yep. We will Til talk yep. to you all later. Till next time. In another bye, stream. Guys. Bye, bye, everybody. <laughs>